Hello, everybody. Starting uh, a couple minutes early today. How about that? Well, uh, more like two minutes early. Uh, please uh, let me know if you're here in the chat. Also, let me know if uh, the visuals are fine, if you can hear me. In fact, I will check that for my... Looks good, looks good. Hello, the silent pump. And light is here. Hello, everybody. Apostolus, hello, hello. How's everybody doing? <clears throat> uh, it's good to see you all here. Um, this stream was supposed to happen about a week ago, but, you know, there was a little something going around. I got sick. Uh, a pretty bad cold, I think, so I had to uh, put it off for a week. Uh, it kind of disrupted the whole filming schedule. I wasn't able to film a Rome reaction. We had to postpone the live stream, but we're back. I'm still, I'm still a bit sick, so if I have to clear my throat, uh, enter into a coughing fit, or blow my nose, I apologize. I'll try not to do anything too disgusting on camera, <laughs> but I'm still a little bit congested, but, you know, we're here. Uh, I've been back to filming videos. Um, any of you guys on the Patreon will notice that we just uploaded a new Rome reaction. Uh, hey, if you're interested in that, you can check out the Patreon in the description down below. Uh, so we're, you know, we're back to rolling, getting everything going. Um... So yeah, and so uh, we will be streaming today as planned. Mm -hmm. The little reference from light there. I, you know, I, I don't want to spoil too much for those who haven't watched it. So I'll talk in uh, in vague terms. But yeah, I, I I really like how they did that scene. You know, I was waiting to see how they portrayed Caesar's reaction. Because I think that's a pretty interesting moment in that whole era, you know. Um, you know, his reaction's a real fascinating one. And I think surprising to a lot of people. And so I was hoping that they would do it justice. And I feel like they did. I think they definitely did do it justice. Now I'm still... The thing I'm curious about now is their depiction of Cleopatra. I'm still waiting to... Uh, to get a little more of that, to see sort of what they're going for, you know, Cleopatra is, has been a, a bit of a controversial character since she was around, so, you know, I, I, it's interesting to see. Cassius Dio would accuse Caesar of faking it. Yeah, look, there's a lot of different perspectives on Caesar's reaction to the death of Pompey, right? Um, I know, obviously, he was outwardly upset. And I frankly think that was genuine, but as I talked about in the reaction, there's a couple of different factors that play into that reaction. You know, uh, was Caesar just faking it to make himself appear more favorable? I don't think so. Was Caesar genuinely upset because, you know, he was uh, appalled at how Pompey had been disgraced in his final days, maybe? Was Caesar upset that he didn't have the PR victory of bringing Pompey back into the fold? You know, there's a there's a lot of different stuff. But I do believe that Caesar was legitimately upset. I really do. Um, and part of that was probably due to, you know, how Caesar liked to frame himself in his image, certainly. But I do think he was genuinely not pleased. Hello, Harry. Welcome, everybody, to the stream. Um, <clears throat> uh, you'd say, Cleopatra was as great a Hellenistic king as any other. Her reputation is mainly due to Roman historian biases. Um, I'm well, Harry. How are you doing? Uh, Apostolus, I would have to agree. You know, there's been a lot of different depictions of Cleopatra, a lot of speculation. Um... You know, there's this whole depiction of her as this sort of Eastern seductress who got Caesar and then Mark Antony. But, you know, I really think that Cleopatra was cunning, intelligent, skilled. 
you know, she was a pretty powerful leader, and I think you can look at a lot of the things she did, and they can be explained by her motivation, um, you know, of empowering Egypt and empowering herself, which I think is perfectly fair from her position. Hello, Shad. Shad's here. Uh, we have, uh, you know, Roy Dean as well. We have a lot of the... Uh, the, the typical suspects. <laughs> uh, Roy Dean, it's not hard to see why Caesar would be upset about his death. Um, well, I mean, yeah, yeah. Caesar and Pompey were once upon a time close political allies. And so I think one of, you know, like I said, there's a couple of factors um, over why Caesar was upset about the death of Pompey. And one of the supposed factors is that Caesar and Pompey did have a genuine personal relationship. And so Caesar just might have been personally upset. And I think that definitely could have been a part of it. I mean, you know, Caesar could be brutal at times, but I do think he was generally a sort of merciful, magnanimous character. And he wasn't happy when something like that happened. You know, he wanted to form those alliances with people uh, and bring people back into his circle. So that's what I think. Cleopatra inherited a dying kingdom surrounded by a superior power. Yeah, exactly. And I think given that context, Cleopatra did what she had to. Uh, that's really what I think. Uh, do you like Napoleon and was he a dictator or a man of the revolution? Well, I, I think Napoleon's a fascinating character. I I I'm very interested by him. And um, I, this is really one of the great questions of Napoleon's legacy. You know, was he a dictator? Was he a man of the revolution? Did he betray the revolution or did he continue the ideals of the revolution? And, you know, not to give the sort of wishy-washy historian answer, but as Roy Dean says, I have to agree, it's both. It really is both. Napoleon did believe in many of the ideals of the revolution, and while he did grow more conservative as he got older, and he did betray many of the ideals of the revolution, uh, if you want to look at the spread of revolutionary ideals throughout Europe, Napoleon was single-handedly more responsible for that than anybody else, you know? Of course, the revolution had already been going for years in France itself, and frankly, by the time Napoleon took over, the revolution had completely sputtered out, you know? I mean, they had gone through the reign of terror, and then the conservative reaction, and then the corrupt and pragmatic directory. The revolution in France was really... it really flattened out <laughs> by the time Napoleon arrived, so... You could... I think in some ways, he sort of brought it back in France... And if you look at French revolutionary and liberal ideas outside of France, Napoleon is single-handedly the most responsible for spreading them. The Napoleonic Code, uh, even a lot of these sister republics, which were French puppets, absolutely. Um, you know, the French were very chauvinistic. They wanted to control uh, these new republics they were establishing, but they did in many ways spread these revolutionary ideals. So... Napoleon was both. You know, you can point to examples of him betraying the revolution. You can point to examples of him forwarding the ideals of the revolution. Napoleon was... Napoleon was someone who... I mean, I think I agree with Light. Napoleon was very pragmatic. Now, I do believe Napoleon did have ideals. But he was pragmatic. Um, and so he would do what he had to do. So, he's a complicated character, not to mention that, and I think Roy Dean points this out, um, it's not as if there's, you know, just, it's not as if the French Revolution was a simple thing. We don't necessarily have a list of, okay, this is with the revolution and this is against. At times, it got very complicated. It was sort of unclear what was revolutionary, what was counter-revolutionary, so it's a complicated question. Doru 2, hello, hello. 
Uh, Napoleon needed an ego check. Spain and Russia were Crassus's Parthian campaign. Levels are bad. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, Napoleon took some serious L's near the end of his life. Yes, Na Napo Napoleon should have invaded the Sassanids. Yeah, maybe he was a tad, a tad late for that. But imagine if <laughs> that was Napoleon's next... Uh, next campaign to invade Persia. I mean, hey, at one point it seemed like Napoleon may become a more Middle Eastern figure. He really thought about converting to Islam. Um, hey, Romans here. Not much Roman. We've just been chatting about Roman history and our favorite almost Muslim Napoleon. <laughs> yeah, the, the potential alternate history where Napoleon moves further eastward and becomes emperor of China. <laughs> um, okay, so, we, we can keep chatting, but what we're doing today um, is we are, I mean, the only one particular thing I have planned for today is reacting to San Roman's how to raise a medieval army. I mean, this is really more of a how-to stream, you know what I mean? We're gonna learn how to raise a medieval army. I think a skill that could come in useful to myself and many of you. I mean, it really depends how the future goes, right? And so that's what we'll be learning today. And then, of course, we'll have time for other reactions after that. So, you know, get, get your recommendations ready and if anybody wants to send in a super chat, I would prioritize those reactions. Um, but first, we're doing How to Raise a Medieval Army by Sand Roman. Uh, where, here we are. I'm trying to find the, uh, the correct template. I also need to blow my nose, for which I will mute. Uh, like I said, I'm pretty, still, still pretty congested, but I'm, I'm working through it for you guys. Um, not to portray myself as <laughs> too much of a warrior or anything. <laughs> uh, if we ever find ourselves in medieval Europe, well, uh, you know, who knows how the future shall be, Roy Dean? Who knows how the future shall be, you know? I mean, maybe, maybe we will regress to a more feudal era. I don't know. This is specifically about Western Europe. All right. I shall keep that in mind. I mean, look, when we talk about the medieval era, oftentimes when specifically Westerners talk about the medieval era, they're actually imagining a pretty small area of the world, a.k.a. sort of medieval Western, maybe Central Europe, <laughs> versus, of course, there was a whole lot more going on. <laughs> I mean, I appreciate the vote of confidence, Roman. <laughs> I'd be a force to be reckoned with on the battlefield. <laughs> I mean, look, if the most... If the most worthy skills for a general to have were reacting and making sharp comments, then I certainly would be a force to be reckoned with. But as it is, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> yeah, the general public's idea of the medieval era is plate armor, knights, longbows, all that sort of business. I mean, I am not a medieval historian, you know what I mean? Um, I do not know too much about the medieval era, but over the last couple of years, I've learned a lot more about it and a lot more say about the Eastern Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, and that's a whole other area of medieval history that I might not have thought of if I was thinking about that stereotypical medieval history. But now I'm thinking, oh, you know, you've got the Byzantines and you've got the, the Muslim world and, and beyond. So there's a whole lot more going on. Medieval Europe is what happens when civilization falls. Yeah, I mean, look, I know there's a lot of debate about... Um, 
the dark, the quote unquote dark ages. I don't use that term, but a lot of people are very say that, you know, there's basically a spectrum of how bad do you think the dark ages were? And there's people arguing every point on that spectrum. I don't think the dark ages were necessarily as bad as some people claim they were, but Medieval Europe is absolutely what happens after a great empire falls. You see the disintegration of these structures of power, uh, a bunch of new locuses of power forming, uh, a lot of different states fighting with each other, a lot of warfare, you know, less resources to go around, etc., etc. All that, all that sort of business. The best generals are reactive. <laughs> yes, just like a reaction YouTuber, Roman. Exactly. What even is medieval, though, asks Shad. Um, medieval is generally seen as around the fall of Western Rome through... It's very vague. Maybe through... I mean, basically up until the early modern era, so maybe through the Renaissance or the fall of Constantinople or the Age of Ex Exploration, but definitely starts before the crowning of Charlemagne. <laughs> they were dark ages due to the lack of street lights. Yeah... As Perkinos points out, no medievalist today would use the term Dark Ages, which is why I don't use the term. I mean, I'm not an expert on the topic, but it's sort of a more popular term that I don't think is really applicable. Or at least it's not that accurate. Unless you're just saying it was literally dark, but then most of human history was literally dark. <laughs> Without, you know, electricity. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a great point, Roman. It, it, it is funny when people talk about, you have these people talking about, oh, the death of the West and Western civilization, and they love to use medieval symbolism, but if you want to look at a time when Europe maybe wasn't doing super well, you might look at that medieval era. <laughs> um, all right, I say we get started on this video. Y'all can tell me if... I need to turn the audio up or down, um, but we shall be starting How to Raise a Medieval Army by Sand Roman History. I've never seen this channel before, but it was recommended. Uh, I believe this video in particular was recommended by Light, who's in chat right now, recommended in the Discord. So hey, if you guys want to talk about history, check out the Discord. It's linked in the description. I always love when we get uh, more Discord members, but let's start with this reaction. How to Raise a Medieval Army. Oh, my audio is muted. There we go. There we go. <laughs> good, good way to start. Contrary to popular belief, armies in the Middle Ages were not just made up of knights in shining armor who brought along their small retinue of peasants to the battlefield. Oh yeah. The reality. I mean, look, you need a lot of foot soldiers to form a medieval army. Uh, yeah, ten out of ten star. Uh, yeah, sure, Harry. Give g give any theories you want to give, though we may be a little distracted by the medieval history. Was that medieval armies were assembled in a variety of ways, depending on their purpose and various other factors. This video explains how to raise a medieval army in Europe for an offensive campaign outside one's own borders. All right, guys, how do we raise a medieval army? Remember, we're we're learning how to do this, so. Step one, spread the word, all right? Y'all y'all better be taking notes. You better be writing down what you're seeing here because you may have to do this one day, okay? The first crucial step was to start planning ahead of time. A wise king would begin to organize the next year's campaign as early as in autumn or winter. Then, at some point late in the year, let's say a court held at Christmas, he would gather the man. I just got to point out Robin's... <laughs> I'm about to go Peter the Hermit mode. Yeah, if you want to raise a medieval army, I would not recommend going Peter the Hermit mode. <laughs> Pick up a bunch of scrappy peasants as you make your way east, ruining a bunch of towns that want nothing to do with you, and then most of them don't even make it where they need to go. You know, Peter the Hermit. Although Peter stuck around long after his band of peasants had uh, failed to do what they needed to do. But, 
you know, maybe Peter is not, uh, not the role model we need to follow. <laughs> and he would be going to rely on for planning and executing his campaign and tell them about his intentions. These men would then bring the news of the impending war to their estates so that preparations could be made. Usually they had all winter to prepare because war was seasonal in the Middle Ages. Because the weather made logistics more difficult and diseases posed a severe threat in winter, campaigns were carried out in spring, summer and autumn. For these reasons, medieval armies tended to assemble no sooner than in early May or even later. The composition and organization of an army varied wildly depending on time, place and purpose. Yeah, I mean that's a good thing to point out. So first off, we see that the king largely works through their vassals, works through their feudal lords because, as we talked about, you know, we're talking about medieval Europe, we've had the collapse of the Roman Empire, there was no such centralized power. Europe at this point is broken down to a bunch of scattershot kingdoms and states and bishoprics in a feudal style, so you gotta work through those under you in a rather decentralized manner. But, as they pointed out, this video is sure to generalize, and when we're talking about it, we're sure to generalize. Anything we're talking about here could be very different based on what specific example we're talking about. Armies composed very differently could form, they could form in different ways, etc, etc, etc. Crusader Kings taught me that you need to save up money prestige to pay for the men-at-arms and upgrade your culture for better units. <laughs> yeah, Shad, as a medieval king, is, you know going through the checklist that he learnt from Crusader Kings. Epic History TV video on how to build a castle. See, if we're entering into another feudal age, which, I mean, is unlikely, but hey, never say never, right? Then how to build a castle might also be something worth knowing for the future, I don't know. Private wars, feuds, or border raids, for example, differed fundamentally from what we are looking at here. Because of this great variety, we need to simplify things and highlight the central features of raising an army in the Middle Ages. This is to say, please be aware that in the next few minutes, we will provide you only with a general wow. overview. Look at this breakdown. This is a, a very interesting breakdown to look at. And once again, I'm not a medieval historian. Well, I'm actually no type of historian. I mean, the channel is History Student Reacts. Um, but I know more about some things than others, and medieval history isn't one of those things, but we can look at this sort of general outline, and it gets, the thing is, it gets really fuzzy when you get to one end or the other. So, we have here, late antiquity is measured as 284 to 700 AD, but that 700 AD part is, uh, you know, pretty sussy. You know, I would argue that late antiquity ended before 700 AD, and the early Middle Ages, you could move that back from 700. To what point exactly? I don't know. Is it the fall of the Western Empire? Maybe. I mean, I don't know. But, here we have late antiquity, 284 to 700 AD, early Middle Ages, 700 AD to 1050. I would argue that late antiquity should be shifted backwards. And the early Middle Ages should start earlier. Then we have the High Middle Ages, 1050 to 1250. I think this is kind of what people might think about oftentimes when they think about the Middle Ages, the medieval era. They think about the High Middle Ages. That's maybe most characteristic, most stereotypical. And then, once again, it gets really fuzzy. We get to the late Middle Ages, 1250 to 1500. And that end date, 1500, is real fuzzy. When exactly do the late Middle Ages end? There's a lot of debate over this. There's sort of a agreed-upon time period when the Middle Ages end. You know, the Middle Ages begin to end around the time of the fall of Constantinople, the beginning of the Age of Exploration, and maybe some people would argue around the time of um, the Renaissance. 
I, frankly, I think the Age of Exploration is really the important cutoff point, in my opinion. But some people put more emphasis on the Renaissance. Uh, and then we get to the early modern period, which, uh, as Light says, is might be the most fussy one of them all. <laughs> early modern period, who knows when that is... When I think early modern period, I'm thinking sort of your 15, 16, 1700s-ish. That's largely what I'm thinking of. But it, it it's it's real fuzzy. And we usually break it down a little bit more than that. I mean, there's a famous term um, that I used in my Discord, actually, which is the, uh, the long 18th century, a.k.a. the late 1600s through the 1700s into the early 1800s, um, which is sort of this one time period. Um, I agree with that categorization. Um, but, but yeah, it, it gets real fuzzy. And yeah, I, I agree with what Shad is saying. The reason why these dates are so fuzzy is because it's not like each of these different eras was begun by one single event. We're talking about really important changes over a long span of time. So as much as us historians want to, we can't actually point to one date as a cutoff date because it's a slow change over time, right? I mean, look, we talk about sort of the end of the Middle Ages and the end of feudalism, but in many places, serfdom continued long into the early modern period. It just depends on where you're looking. Um, you know, industrialization began in England far earlier than it began in other places, so it, it's real fuzzy. It's real fuzzy. Um... And yeah, Lights makes some great points. First off, the Age of Absolutism. This is a subcategory we might draw in the early modern period. Like I said, you can you can break down each of these eras even further, early modern, into you have your Age of Absolutism in the long 18th century. And then you have, some people will talk about the short 19th century. Um, and then also, we periodization is the only way to categorize history and make it sort of easier to study. And we need to do that, right? I mean, it is necessary for us to categorize history so that we can effectively study it. But when we do that, we always need to keep in mind that we are drawing arbitrary boundaries uh, and we are using sort of arbitrary terminology. As long as you keep that in mind and don't, don't trip yourself up, then you're fine. It's like, you know, we talk about the Eastern Roman Empire we, many people call that the Byzantine Empire. It never referred to itself as the Byzantine Empire. I think it's fine to use that term as long as you know that that's not what they would have used, right? So I think it's fine to use these categorizations as long as you keep in mind that a lot of these are pretty arbitrary. History, some of the most picky people, yeah. I mean, you find this in a lot of academic professions, but yes. We are pretty picky in uh, in history. And of course, we're just talking about Europe here. And honestly, more specifically, sort of Western Europe. If you zoomed out, you know, if we wanted to say you wanted to talk about periodization in China, totally different story. <laughs> and it gets even more complicated. Yeah. Okay. So we've had the discussion about period periodization, categorization, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now we can uh, get back into how to raise a medieval army. Of the techniques of recruitment in the high and late Middle Ages. To do so, we streamline the findings of modern historiography. In most cases, an official call up was issued by the royal chancellery about two months before the start of the campaign. In this royal order, time and place of gathering were announced to the most powerful people in the realm. Visualized as a pyramid, the top layer consisted of archbishops, bishops, counts, masters of orders, barons, abbots, princes, and royal officials such as sheriffs, seneschals, and magistrates. Mm. 
As soon as these men received the king's order, they began to prepare and gather their retinue. All right, we're on to step two. So step one, spread the word. You know, we have our medieval hierarchy. You need to get the word to all of those on the layer below you. Your lords, your bishops, your officials, and then they spread the word further down. Step two, now we are at vertical recruitment. I guess we're going to see what that is all about. Uh, what vids did you pick for the stream? Uh, well, Shad, we chose this one. And then after this one, uh, it's going to be based on whatever y'all recommend. And like I said, if anybody wants to make a Super Chat donation and put a recommendation in there, then I will obviously give priority to that. But, you know, we'll decide after this what we're going to do. Uh, afterwards. This is the only video I actually had planned to react to, but of course we'll have much more time after this one. A king or prince drew mainly on three types of troops, namely feudal levies, mass levies, and external contingents, that is, mercenaries and the troops of dependents and allies. Most of the mounted troops, which were considered the most important part of a medieval army, were recruited through feudal levies. In feudal structures... Alright, I do have to give a quick disclaimer in chat. Uh, I'm not completely allergic to politics, but, you know, largely, let's uh, sort of keep away from the political chat, you know? Unless it has something to do with the uh, relevant history, you know what I mean? Uh, if you want to have a particular chat about modern politics, hey, you can hit up the Discord and go into the, uh, the post-World War II channel. That's for modern stuff. Um, it's alright, it's alright, Harry. I just largely try to keep it a little bit away from politics. Um, <laughs> uh, unless it's medieval politics in this case. Some lords, called tenants-in-chief, were granted lands or fiefs directly by the king. In return, they owed him a general assistance, had to advise and support him at court or at war. They owed him a defined contingent of fighters, usually between 5 and 500 men-at-arms, depending on the size and significance of their fiefdom. Often, they would bring even more than what was required to win the favor of the king or to show off their power and wealth. Strictly speaking, the term feudal levies can only be applied to the late Middle Ages, when most medievalists agree a feudal military structure actually existed. Guy Halsell, for example, one of the leading researchers on the transitional period from late antiquity to the early Middle Ages, has <laughs> coined the term I like a warfare and society of the barbarian west. Good book title, I like that. Uh, the idea of feudal military structures is sparked very controverse is that a word controversial controverse discussions amongst historians most of them conclude that before the 11th century there were similar structures but uh some some um <laughs> yeah Yeah, no, Byzantine politics are interesting as well. Um, no, I, I'm a fan of politics too, especially historically um, and modern politics. But, you know, I try to keep our channel largely historical in nature. Um, but I understand the interest in politics, I absolutely do. Vertical recruitment to better encompass all forms of recruitment based on Lord Vessel relationships. Using this term allows us to include all different kinds of relationships that were used to summon soldiers in the Middle Ages. We will get back to this again in the next chapter of the video. When a tenant-in-chief was summoned to join an army, he had his work cut out for him. He had to raise money for the upcoming venture and make preparations for his absence. Mm. After all, he would be away from his lands for a long time. In some cases even longer than <laughs> half a year. Yeah, g great. <laughs> Great from Roman. I will fully incorporate toxic and logical fallacy ridden modern political attacks on medieval figures. Yeah. I mean, we talk about this a bunch, Roman. Obviously, neither of us um, mind talking about politics at all. But when you bring a very uh, all-consuming political mindset 
to history, oftentimes you can sort of be blinded by that particular perspective and maybe not able to see some of the objective truths in front of you. That's my view, at least. Hello, Peter. Hello. Welcome to the chat. Welcome to the chat. We're learning how to raise a medieval army. <laughs> Yeah, and, and Roy Dean. <laughs> Fear not, my lord, leave me in charge. I will look after your land. You know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Yeah. I mean, this is, of course, the dangerous thing about this sort of feudal setup. You know, we've lost the centralized authority of the Roman Empire, and so everybody is responsible for their own little patch of territory. And so now if you're a feudal lord and your king has called you to battle, well, that's great. First off, you got to gather the resources and men. Second off, you need to make sure that nothing bad happens while you're away. And that can sometimes be a difficult challenge. Now, maybe you have someone responsible to leave behind. Maybe you don't. Maybe that person who you think you can leave behind in charge. Maybe your son or brother is actually a power-hungry opportunist who's going to seize the chance while you're gone. So it gets a little bit dangerous. <laughs> there were no usurpers in Roman history. Shad will confirm this fact. Yeah, well, the... <laughs> funny. Yeah, well, the thing is, Light points out leaving someone else in charge always worked out for the Romans, though. Now we take that, you know, where we see that issue with many Roman emperors, and now you dilute it to every other European lord. Now everybody has their own little fiefdom to take care of. It gets very complicated and turns out not necessarily an efficient way of doing things, but when you have a massive empire that collapses and all disastrous stuff happens, sometimes feudalism is the only way to go, I guess. <laughs> Besides this, a magnate's most important task was to assemble his retinue. While he would be taking pretty much any man fit for service in the case of a defensive war, a more careful choice was made for an offense. Yep, and this is the, this is a true little fun fact about Otto von Bismarck. Uh, for those that don't know, a very prominent 19th century Prussian slash German politician, statesman, uh, he during, I believe it was the whole 1848 revolution shenanigans, he did try to raise his servants to march on the capital using his position as a feudal lord, which, of course, in the mid-19th century was uh, a pretty anachronistic thing to do, but he, he tried to use that, right? <laughs> campaign. He needed capable men at his side, but even more capable ones to manage his lands in his absence. Moreover, the selection of the retinue often had a political dimension, because the potential participants were also the constituents of the magnet. Therefore, he was obliged to look after their interests. While some were eager to go to war with him, others preferred to stay at home. <laughs> These wishes had to be taken into consideration. Normally, the war... Yeah, if only every mobilization for feudal war was like the formation of the fellowship. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't think it was always that honorable and chivalrous. Oh, these wishes had to be taken into consideration. Normally, the war household of a prince was composed of men from his immediate environment. On one hand, there were non-combatants, such as servants, wagoners, cooks, or scribes. There were also doctors and surgeons, who were usually recruited from outside. On the other hand, a significant part of the combatants of the retinue was recruited from the household. Some of them were professional fighters, such as soldiers of the house troops, bodyguards, or weapon instructors, but also the holders of non-military offices, such as administrators, advisors, or hunters. Yeah, I mean, of course you had a variety of hired talent at the time. They talk about those who may be employed by the households. Mercenaries also made many, many appearances throughout the medieval era. Mercenaries could be a, a big part of one's medieval army. Um, I mean, we recently had a uh, Patreon and channel member exclusive video about Harold Herdrada 
And of course, he served in the Varangian Guard, uh, a.k.a. a sort of Viking mercenary for the Byzantine Empire. Um, so mercenaries could play a, a big role. And of course, like I said, hired talent beyond just mercenaries. Uh, yes, Harry, I do have a gaming channel. Um, but yes, if you fail to pay your mercenaries, then you can be in a lot of trouble. Mercenaries can be fickle. Now, sometimes that's a good thing, um, because, look, mercenaries are just relying on who can pay them the most. They don't necessarily want to get involved in local politics if it doesn't benefit them. So that can be good for you. But if the mercenaries see a better opportunity elsewhere, or you're unable to pay them, yeah, you run into a lot of issues with the mercenaries. Would it be incorrect to say that medieval armies were self-funded for a majority of the period? Um, well, I guess it depends what you mean by self-funded. I mean... We don't necessarily have uh, a lot of complex government structures, and so, but money is raised from a variety of places. Um, I mean, to a high degree, it was self-funded. I mean, funded by, uh, I mean, of course, you had to raise funds if you were the lord or the king, but then there was also funds brought in by looting and plunder. So, I mean, it's kind of complicated, but if that's what you mean by self-funded, then yeah, in part self-funded. Um, yeah, and Light is Light is pointing that out uh, in a, a comment. Jada is more loyal to Will Smith. Yeah, uh, the Praetorian Guard is not particularly loyal. Everybody knows that, or at least past a certain point were expected to provide armed service because of their social status or office. Only few tenants-in-chief had sufficient household troops to fulfill their duty to the king with those alone. This was not a problem, however, because they in turn had lent land to lesser magnates who owed them support in return. They could now fall back on these men so that the whole procedure was repeated on a lower level and on smaller scale. Yep, so and I mean, this is exactly what we talk about. When we talk about these medieval feudal structures, hierarchies, um, everything gets very decentralized and complicated where, of course, you have this structure running down from the king, this hierarchy, and then that hierarchy repeats itself with lords and feudal levies and lesser magnates and etc., etc. So you get really a big pyramid scheme that <laughs> really flares out at the bottom. Is there an example that say mercenaries take religion into account like the Thirty Years' War, or is it more like distance between them and their uh, destiny, like Scots fighting for Sweden? Um, I mean... Oh, between them and their destination, right. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know. I think mercenaries are generally motivated by money, but I'm sure you can find some examples where they're driven by some sort of ideological motivation. But even, I mean, if you look at the Thirty Years' War, the Thirty Years' War is often framed as a religious conflict, and it absolutely was, but, you know, you see powers like France not necessarily taking the Catholic side because they're motivated by earning money and power for themselves. So, mercenaries often go where the money is, and even in a lot of so-called ideological conflicts, there can often be underlying political or monetary causes. So, you know, it's it's complicated, it's nuanced like everything, but that's sort of generally what I would say. The king called upon his tenants-in-chief for allegiance. They summoned the magnates who were subordinate to them. And the magnates, in turn, called upon, for example, the knights residing in their dominions. Theoretically, this could go on for a long time, but according to the historian Clifford... Uh, yes, the rivalry between France and the Habsburgs, uh, as, as has been pointed out, yes. Uh, th that was one of the big motivators. Um, the, the French, like I said, 
you know, of course they would be religious allies, but once again, the Thirty Years' War was not just a religious conflict, the French were motivated by politics as well, and so they wanted to side against the Habsburgs, try to knock them down a peg. Rogers, cases in which more than four order summons were issued were rare. In many cases, however, even this was not enough to fill the tenant-in-chief's contingent, so that they had to resort to troops outside the feudal chain of dependency. In most cases, relatives and acquaintances who were not mastered themselves volunteered to fill the ranks. If a vassal had the wherewithal to recruit additional troops, in addition to the costly task of raising and equipping his retinue, mercenaries were a possible solution, too. Mm -hmm. These were often needed when local lords refused to fight wars abroad because venturing beyond one's country was quite the adventure in the Middle Ages. <laughs> Even though it could make a soldier incredibly rich, it was very risky. Avoiding all the risks, but getting all the benefits from going abroad has become a real possibility today with NordVPN, the sponsor uh. of this part of the video. With NordVPN, you can access the internet at any Good old NordVPN. Yes, well, in some places throughout Europe, especially, I, I, I often think of the Balkans when I say this, they have the, the old Roman road system, but of course, the upkeep had not been great since the fall of the Western Empire, and so European infrastructure was not necessarily great during the Middle Ages. <laughs> it became a little challenging to travel long distances. And it became challenging, I mean, for infrastructure, also because, like I said, that sort of centralized power had collapsed in terms of the Roman Empire. And we see how difficult it is to raise men here. It was really difficult to raise a large amount of soldiers, especially if you wanted them to go a long distance. I mean, when we look at the Middle Ages, when I think about large mobilizations of troops... Probably the first example that comes to mind is the Crusades, you know? I mean, that was a kind of shockingly large mobilization of men who managed to travel a pretty far distance. I mean, we're talking about, in some cases, from Western Europe all the way to the Holy Land with, in some cases, the assistance of the Byzantines and then later, not exactly. Um, and of course, th that was sort of a unique situation that was uh, an international, wow, an international coalition of sorts. That's not really the right word for it. But, you know, lords and knights and soldiers from a variety of different countries brought together under the same banner. Well, not really under the same banner, but at least supposedly under the same cause to go in the same direction, roughly. <laughs> I mean, look, the Crusades were... Um, oftentimes a mess, so everything gets a little fuzzy, but undeniably it was a large mobilization of men that wasn't commonly seen throughout the medieval era. The road system in Byzantium, Rome, and Cordoba were by far the best in Europe at the time. Yes, a lot of people missed the Roman postal system, the Roman infrastructure system, etc., etc., the link in the description now yeah when you go on a crusade to take back the holy land and end up sacking constantinople instead oopsie oopsie daisy didn't mean to do that <laughs> while the call-up was passed down the feudal dependency pyramid the seems rare that medieval armies number more than the low five figures yeah yeah absolutely no this, this has absolutely been my experience looking at medieval armies you know and once again, this is a broad, broad generalization, but it seems like usually when you talk about medieval armies, you're talking about a force of men, maybe around 10,000, maybe on the high end, force of 20,000, on the low end, less than 10,000. I mean, you look at some prominent battles throughout European history and you're talking about like an army of 4,000 versus an army of 5,000, you know? So we are generally... Uh, not talking about a massive amount of men in a lot of these wars. Uh, <laughs> yeah, as compared to, as Shad says, Chinese wars, Quin Shu sneezes on a passerby, 50 million people perish. <laughs> yeah, compared to China, where you look at 
and I'm not familiar with Chinese history that much, I look at a bunch of wars in Chinese history that I've never heard of, and it's like death toll, 500,000, a million. Like, oh my god, what is going on over there? <laughs> the First Crusade may be as many as 60,000, which was gigantic for the Middle Ages. Exactly, that's what I'm saying when I say that uh, the Crusades were a very rare mobilization of a lot of men from the Middle Ages at a time when a lot of these feudal lords and kings couldn't mobilize more than 15,000 men. You have tens of thousand. Men at arms began to prepare. They usually had to provide and finance all their own equipment, <clears throat> including mounts, weapons, armor, and personnel, since they had already been paid in form of their fee. The An Lushan Rebellion in China is an absolutely preposterously lethal event. Uh, I don't think I'm familiar with that, or at least I don't remember it. So in the ancient world, were armies larger than medieval because of population density or centralization? So, and I'm no expert, but I would say, there's a couple of reasons, but I would say largely centralization. Um, so Jason, I mean, if you compare your medieval era to, say, the height of the Roman Empire, the height of the Roman Empire, if the empire needs to, it has this massive system of resources, mobilization, infrastructure, that it can utilize to mobilize tens, hundreds of thousands of soldiers, bring them together, because it has this powerful centralized government. Then we fast forward to the Middle Ages, and that centralized power has broken down, and what we have is a bunch of much smaller medieval states. I wouldn't necessarily say it's population density, but... With all these smaller states, they have, first off, just less people within their territory. They have less resources, less infrastructure. They just can't mobilize big armies. They don't have the administrative power. So I would absolutely say it's a function of the centralization of the Roman Empire. Uh, 13 to 36 million estimated deaths for An Lushan. My goodness. Roman, what, what year was uh, on Lushan, or like what time period generally? That's an absolutely massive amount of casualties. Yep, it was so much harder to feed, maintain, mobilize large armies in the Middle Ages. 8th century, 700s, wow! 700s AD, and we're talking about <laughs> tens of millions of deaths when, you know, once again, we go back to Europe, and, I mean, you know, you can look at different places throughout the world. I mean, we have a pretty powerful caliphate at that point, but if you go to, like, your Western Europe, once again, we're talking about relatively small numbers of people. Uh, the Tang Dynasty, okay, okay, we've done a, a video or two on the, we did the Battle of Talas between the Caliphate and the Tang Dynasty, so I know just the, the tiniest thing about it. <laughs> it's just like their lords. Although the men-at-arms were considered the central part of a magnet's retinue, they usually made up only a fraction of it. An important lord would lead dozens or hundreds of men into war. According to the historian Clifford Rogers, the contingent of an average baron might have included about 100 horses and 50 men, of which about three were knights and nine squires, each mm. of whom again brought their own servants and retinue. Wow, look at this art. Where exactly is this little retinue station? Looks lovely. <laughs> In Europe, even... Yeah, I mean, if you look at the Byzantine Empire of the medieval era... Um, they struggled to mobilize as much as 20,000 people because, I mean, first off, they'd just been diminished so much from the height of the Roman Empire. Um, they also did not have nearly the amount of resources they needed. They also needed to have armies supplied throughout their territory to protect their borders. And so, yeah, even a state like the Byzantine Empire could not mobilize that many men during the medieval era.
Tang is pronounced like Tong. Oh, okay. Tong. Got it. Got it. In addition to the men at arms, these included armorer, craftsmen, pages, cooks, stewards, clergymen, musicians, heralds, and many more. In most cases, almost all men except the nobles had a dual function. Many servants fought as infantrymen or archers, in addition to their duties in the camp. The feudal levies of the late Middle Ages and earlier forms of vertical recruitment were the core element in raising an army for an offensive campaign. They brought most of the men-at-arms and many of the soldiers to an army, but there were other ways of recruiting men as well. All right, step three, horizontal recruitment. Uh, as Light said, it makes me think of, you know, vertical integration and horizontal integration in terms of, uh, like, corporations. You know, we talk about in the, the sort of gilded era of the late 1800s, <laughs> even though we're talking about something quite different. Yeah, yeah, you have the Black Death coming along, wiping out at least a third of Europe's population. The Black Death's a real interesting thing. I talked about this in, what was it? Oh, in my reaction to uh, the history of the entire world, I guess. The Black Death was profoundly influential to sort of the trends of European history. I mean, it did a lot of things. One of the things it did was really, it was really damaging to the system of feudalism, the system of serfdom, because when, you know, say a third of your peasant population dies, that gives the remaining peasants a lot of leverage against their feudal lords. And basically, really, tremendously, tremendously influential. Especially if you're studying the larger trends of the period, which, look, I am no expert on, but I do find it very interesting. Uh, yeah, what about, <laughs> Shad says, what about diagonal recruitment? You know, we've done vertical, we've done horizontal. Where's our, where's our diagonal recruitment? <laughs> the second main source of soldiers was the so-called horizontal recruitment. This refers to all direct calls for service from the ruler to his free subjects, mm. rather than through the... Now we're talking about our good old mass levies, or as would occur... If we're looking at this from like the year a thousand, like 700, almost 800 years later, a good old levee en masse in the revolutionary, French revolutionary context. <laughs> the pyramid of Lord Vassal relationships. The best known form of this are militias. Of course, a horizontal call to arms could not work via individual letters, as was the case with feudal levies. Instead, they were proclaimed by royal officers within their jurisdiction. In the early Middle Ages, these were usually counts, who at the time were not yet holders of a high noble title. Later, they would be. For example, sheriffs in England, bailiffs in France, or mayors or city councillors in the Holy Roman Empire. Mm. How I always think that these sort of mid-level authority figures of the medieval era are so fascinating. I don't know anything about them, but... You know, I know some people specialize in the sort of legal history of this era. And, in, you know, like the sheriffs or the mayors and city councilors. What a sort of niche and fascinating character in this whole thing of European history. I, I really know nothing about them, but I just think it's a sort of interesting level of authority to have. Uh, Mass Levy is also known as the French way. Yes, of course, you know, things really... Things were definitely different during the revolution. We have a sort of different style of mass mobilization and nationalism and, you know, patriotism and etc. etc. Yes, well, the, the, the HRE was a very, you know, decentralized and sort of style of government. I mean, it wasn't really a style of government at all, so it would it was very difficult to raise any sort of coalition or army during uh, in the HRE. Where is Eastern Rome? Uh, so sorry, Shad, but the Ottoman Empire has taken over everything but Constantinople at this point. 
the the powerful Ottoman Empire, according to some, the true successor to the Roman Empire. Now, I don't believe that. <laughs> I don't believe that, but there people do argue that sometimes. France had the largest population in Europe, still unable to raise armies. Uh, above 20 to 30k speaks to the fact that centralized centralization was the key to mobilization. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, I mean, this is what we see when we enter into the early modern era. We see centralization of these countries, uh, and that allows them to utilize a wide variety of powers that they couldn't before. And, yeah, Perkinos points out something very uh, worthwhile, which is how decentralized the HRE was really did depend on the time and place. I think when a lot of us think of the HRE, we think especially of sort of the late Holy Roman Empire, which is when it had a lot of scorn heaped upon it by the intellectuals of the era, and it really started to decline in the power it held. But the HRE, uh, it really depends on what time you look at it. If you give me a dollar for every person that tried to claim the title of Roman Emperor, I could single-handedly raise the minimum wage. Yeah, we have a, a lot of people trying to claim the title of Roman Emperor or a successor to the Roman Empire. I mean, of course, Moscow would claim itself the Third Rome, mainly due to their embrace of uh, uh, Eastern Orthodox Christianity, so, you know. However, since such summons were often only used in an emergency, in many cases there was no time for formalities and the call was made in a very simple way, for example, by ringing bells or lighting beacons. While <laughs> vertical recruitment Gondor calls for aid. and feudal armies in general clearly revolved around mounted men-at-arms, horizontal recruitment was primarily aimed at recruiting infantry. Although I mean, those the medieval cavalry, it really is crazy. Even when we're talking about the Crusades, you know, we did a series on the Crusades, but especially if you're talking about just other European warfare of this era, you know, there's a certain amount of infantry. We're talking about armies of a couple thousand, and then a lot of these armies have like a hundred, a couple hundred cavalry, <laughs> but they like really make the difference. It's like, yeah, we've got yeah, maybe a couple thousand infantry. We've got 400 knights, and they're the ones that really do the work. But it's crazy, it's such a small number. Whoever storms the enemy's bastion gets a vial of a well-renewed maiden's bathwater. <laughs> Recruitment stores to 100k. Yeah, that's the, the Belle Delphine method, method for raising a medieval army. Just raise up, raise up your simps. Hold a vote for weekly streams. Uh, I appreciate that, Harry. I know I know you guys enjoy the streams. I, I, I always say I would like to do them more often. This one was supposed to be uh, earlier, but I, I got sick. So I will try to do them more often. It's just, you know, I need an afternoon where I have usually somewhere around like four or three hours to stream. So it can be a little difficult. Although neither was exclusive. The men recruited by horizontal methods were selected from an armed population. According to the historian Clifford Rogers, it was common from the 12th century or earlier that all free men fit for service were required by law to maintain arms and armor proportionate to their wealth. In order to check compliance with these requirements, there were musterings, competitions and training sessions from time to time in many regions. Because of this, a king who wanted to raise an army was able to muster a large number of men in a very short time. However, the troops... Were there any full-time soldiers like in the good old days of the West Roman Empire? Um, I believe there were some small contingents of professional soldiers. I think, maybe. Someone who knows a little bit more can, uh, can correct me on that. I mean, well, first off, you have... Your most reliable soldiers are your sort of feudal lords. Um, but you, you do have your, like, personal retinue 
which uh, yep, Light is pointing out exactly. A household guard, a personal retinue, but we're talking about a, a small number of men. So you would have some professional soldiers. Um, and of course, the closer we get to the modern era, the more we see some elements of professionalization entering into European warfare. And of course, that's one of the big changes that occurs when we sort of enter into the early modern and modern era with the centralization and modernization of these states as we begin to see a lot more professional armies, um, you know, with states like England leading the way or Prussia or, you know, etc., etc. So, yeah, you would have some full-time soldiers. <laughs> Yes, Roy Dean, the days of having, frankly, any full-time soldiers to guard the, the Rhine River are over, and have been over for a long time. Cavalry made the difference during the Middle Ages, <laughs> me and I have several thousand English longbowmen. <laughs> yes. raised in this way were often poorly trained, motivated rather moderately and inadequately equipped, so their military value was often small. Coordinating them entailed great logistical difficulties, which is why they were usually deployed only for a short time and mostly in their home region. In Spain, for example, each household had to provide a soldier in the case of a so-called apelido, a call by the king, but he had only to be provisioned for three days. Though limited in range and capability, such mass musterings could bring together a large number of infantrymen quickly. Thanks to that, this type of recruitment remains. Uh, is men at arms and knighted fights on foot or a heavily equipped non noble? I, uh, honestly, I don't know. I, I think, you know, when we're talking about sort of the top soldiers, we're usually talking about noble knights. But uh, I, I, I really don't know. Maybe someone else could answer. Um. And did any Western European country feature a regular army? Uh, once again, with the specific questions, you know, I, I couldn't necessarily tell you. Uh, like I said, you know, there's a lot of uh, different situations. You know, we are generalizing here. And regular armies were not typically a feature of medieval Europe. But I'm not going to say never. Maybe there is an example. I, I, I don't know. Um, they would, of course, become far more prominent the later we go, but maybe someone else, any any medieval uh, medieval historian types in here could tell you. Oh, oh! Light gave a brilliant example that I, I should have thought of, but I'm in such a European mindset that I didn't even think of it. Yes, the Janissaries of the Ottoman Empire. I can't believe I didn't think of that. When we're talking about uh, professional armies and regular armies, the Ottoman Empire is a great place to turn. They had now the Jan yeah, they had a very professionalized standing army of Janissaries, and they had an interesting system where they actually used a slave levy um, of uh, like Balkan Christians typically that they would then convert to Islam and they would learn Turkish and Arabic etc etc but yes uh, the Ottoman Empire had a very professionalized standing army so there's an example <laughs> um, like I said it's a little outside the sort of European sphere but I mean the Ottoman Empire was as we saw on that map moving into Europe at the time so yeah great example I should have thought of that Uh, already 11 minutes in. Good good pace for an uh, Ethan reaction. Yes, 11 minutes in, we've gone about an hour. Uh, convert to... Well, yeah, you know. Sure, it's a strong word when you're five to six years old, but convert in the most practical sense. Or, I, I guess not convert. They were raised as Muslims would be the best way to put it. I guess they weren't really converted. <laughs> most five-year-olds don't have particularly strong religious beliefs. So I guess, more accurately, they were raised as Muslims. And we have, we have some clarifications of the uh, men-at-arms question in chat. ...remained very important until the late Middle Ages and beyond, especially in frontier areas. 
However, there were also cases in which troops for offensive warfare were raised in a similar way. In 9th century Francia, for example, all free men who owned three or more farm plots, so-called manzi, had to enlist when the king planned an offensive campaign. Those who owed less land had to pool their resources and equip one man for every three manzi by proxy. Similar systems existed, for example among the Lombards in Italy and the Anglo-Saxons. Those who were selected had an important public duty to perform and were therefore supported by their local community. During the 10th and 11th centuries, royal authority declined in favor of the power of nobles and towns. Uh -oh. The idea that subjects should support their king in offensive warfare declined. And in many- Damn, in 1100, they were, they were not caring about their kings, huh? <laughs> Once again, there is complexity within the medieval era that I could not really tell you about because I'm not an expert on the topic, but we have very stereotypical views of this era of history, but there's a lot of complexity within the era. And it's, it's funny, we often have this idea... People, I think, have like overlapping, contrasting, contradictory views. People think about the very powerful absolute monarch, and I think a lot of people imagine that sort of monarch throughout the medieval era, but then people also know about sort of the feudal system which sort of inherently means that your monarch doesn't necessarily have absolute power, right? Um, but, you know, throughout most of the medieval era, your kings are not necessarily that powerful. Now, as we move out of the end of the medieval era into the early modern era, the age of absolutism, the age of exploration, a lot of these monarchs focus on centralizing power, you know, we call this absolute monarchy or absolutism, modernizing, centralizing, trying to downplay the power of their nobility, but that is, I mean, that's past the Middle Ages, not most of the Middle Ages. And once again, there's diversity, there's different examples, but most of these monarchs did not have a super high degree of power, or at least not what I think most people imagine when they think of a medieval king. places disappeared altogether. The notion that the obligation to participate in a military expedition could only come from a personal or contractual relationship that is precisely by feudal ties, for example, quickly gained a lot of attraction after the 12th century. But in the 14th and 15th century, even those who had held a fief were no longer always obliged to serve outside the borders of the realm. Still, Service was sometimes offered to the king in hope for rewards or because of promising benefits if a campaign was going to be successful. But service could no longer be demanded. Sometimes mm. the ruler's right to conscript subjects could also be authorized by a representative assembly, for example, the English parliament or the Catalan courts. One ruler who made frequent use of horizontal recruitment for offensive warfare was Edward III of England. Good old Edward III of, of England. They talked about how they were particularly centralized. England. How long are we into the video? Well, we're 13 minutes in. We're actually getting close to the end. So anybody who has a particular recommendation for what we should react to afterwards, don't say it yet, but start generating those recommendations. Because when we're done with this video, we're going to move on to something else. And I will I will take an idea from the chat. And if we have a couple of good ideas, I might, I might do a poll. He repeatedly recruited large contingents for short service. Yes, and as Shad point, you know, look, as Shad points out, Hammer of the Scots, look, uh, I don't take history too personally, but obviously as, you know, a born and bred Scotsman, I can't favor him too much. <laughs> service periods of 40 days. One of the orders he issued to his so-called commissioners of array, who mustered the troops on his behalf, illustrates the mechanism of summoning armed people. Edward ordered, quote, to array all men aged 16 to 60 in the county of Nottingham, horses as well as footmen, and put them into thousands, hundreds, and twenties, and from them select 500 archers and 200 hobelars, light horsemen, from the strongest and fittest of the men of said country. These men were then to be equipped and sent to fight the Scots in the Scottish Wars of Independence. Boo. Well, normally. W. Scottish W. 
Fight back, Scotland. The summons intended that only the strongest and fittest be mustered. Quite often, those who actually enlisted were the most <laughs> Uh and, and Roman asks, supposedly Braveheart is a very accurate movie and a good representation of medieval era in Scotland, right, Ethan? Uh, I don't think you need me to tell you this, Roman, but, uh, you know, very, very inaccurate movie. I mean, not that all historical movies have to be accurate, but, you know, yeah, R Robert the Bruce is the real, he's the real, uh, real winner of all of this. He's, uh, he's definitely underrated. I mean, William Wallace has really been romanticized, but Robert the Bruce deserves a lot more credit than he gets, frankly. Willing. This could happen for a variety of reasons, but mainly because the men selecting the recruits were themselves involved in local society and therefore were considerate of the wishes of the potential combatants. The king's interest of finding the best fighters wasn't endangered by this, because men fighting deliberately were almost always a more valuable addition to the- It's funny, when you go to Scotland, you don't really see much about William Wallace compared to Robert the Bruce. Yeah, I mean, I've been to Wallace Tower, which is... I'm trying to remember, near Sterling, I think. I might be wrong. I don't really remember. It's been a while. Um, but yeah, yeah, Robert the Bruce. And I think, like, Braveheart has, like I said, given William Wallace a lot more popularity. And he's been um, romanticized a lot. But Robert the Bruce was, you know... You hear a lot more about him. I mean, when I was growing up, I heard more about Robert the Bruce than William Wallace. Um, I think it's changed a little bit because of, cause of Braveheart. But yeah, Robert the Bruce is a, is a popular figure in, in Scotland. The army and those compelled to serve. Knowing that unmotivated soldiers weren't particularly useful, it was sometimes even possible to pay a fee in lieu of personal service. This could then be used to pay for a capable and motivated replacement. It can be concluded, as does Clifford Rogers, that the majority of those recruited horizontally served voluntarily or at least willingly. The troops selected this way were ordered to report at a specified place near the border of the country or region, where their equipment was completed and improved by the country community who either provided it directly or paid for it. In addition, the men received pay for the march and in many cases were provided with a coat of uniform colors as a distinguishing mark. For example, red and white for the men of Norwich in 1385. With these horizontally recruited troops, the second important... Com hey, look, all I gotta say is, you know, we're talking about, you know, England versus Scotland. First off, like I said, I don't have too much of a personal stake in the history. It's all fun and games, but, you know, the English, of course, support England, but, uh... Hey, anyone throughout the world who's had their country colonized by Britain, you should side with Scotland over England. That's all I'm going to say. That's all I'm going to say, as Shad points out. Uh, you know, Scotland W, that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> component of a medieval army was ready and on the march to the assembly point. Ooh, step four. Uh, we are near the end of the video. Uh, fill your ranks. Since in many cases, even vertical and horizontal recruitment wouldn't score sufficient troops for an offensive campaign, it was advisable to tap into other resources. These included mercenaries and troops of dependents and tribute payers and the contingents of allies. Mm. The contingents of allies and dependents were in most cases composed of vertically recruited troops too, and were rarely... <clears throat> How much relevance would you add to the English-Scottish wars of the medieval era? Because even by the time we get to the Jacobite Rebellion, nationalism isn't all that prominent. Um, I don't quite know what you're asking. Relevance to, like, national identity? Or, I mean, you're right. Um, like, Scottish national identity was really developed strongly throughout the 1800s after Scotland had already been, uh, was already a part of, of Britain, uh, had already been sort of conquered by England following the Jacobite Rebellion of the mid-1700s, and that's when a lot of Scottish nationalism arose, and a lot of this history was romanticized. You know, we've done videos on the Jacobite Rebellion of, uh, I think, 1745 um, before, and you can see that 
when it was happening, it was not necessarily framed as a Scotland versus England conflict. Um, there were Scots on both sides. Um, only afterwards, fast forward like a hundred years to the 1800s, was when everything started to be framed from a national context. Um, so it's kind of complicated, but I'm not. I don't know if that answers your question, Roman. I'm not entirely sure. <clears throat> ah. Uh, how different would history have been for Scotland if England was more successful in those wars? Um, man, you know, I really don't know. I, I really don't know much, honestly, about medieval British history broadly. Um, I think... I mean, I, sh I don't know. It could have been different, but Scotland and England always had some sort of relationship. They went back and forth, and then, of course, Scotland, you know, 1707 becomes a part of the Union. Um, so I, I'm not, I'm not sure. I really don't know, Roman. Uh, it's an interesting counterfactual. It's real hard to answer. Maybe it would be different. I think maybe not as well. We might have seen things happen similarly. I'm not quite sure. A Scottish king became the English king. Isn't that enough for you guys? Yeah, the, the famous dynasty of light, the Stuart dynasty. Everyone's famous, or ever, sorry, everyone's favorite monarchs. Not as if they incited uh, the English Civil War. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the how different would history be questions are generally very hard, but that one in particular, it's really hard to say because it's such, like, a complex question. And also, like, I think it's a hard one to answer because I'm not sure it would have been too different. <laughs> Though maybe it would have. I really don't know. ...reported by militias. This was due to the fact that a ruler had little claim on the support of his population when fighting a so-called voluntary war than when defending the interests of the homeland. As of the 13th century, sometimes even before, rulers would also hire mercenaries off the shelf, which means in the form of already existing comp Yeah, I think it's hard to say, Roman, but I don't think those wars are that important to modern Scotland. I'm going to be honest. You know, I think, as is true for a lot of European countries, medieval history is emphasized due to nationalism. And it plays a big role in national identity. But I, I don't think it's as important as people would make it out. Alt history and how different questions force us to realize the significance of these events. Yeah, I, I mean, look, there is, uh, there's a, pl I don't know. In academic history, we don't necessarily look at alt history too much but there is a place for counterfactuals and they can make us re-examine the real history so you know i don't think they're you know i don't think they hold no value they certainly do plus from a less academic perspective i think alt history is fun i don't engage with it too much but i think it can be pretty entertaining and enjoyable Oh, we've got a, a Bernadotte discussion going on. All of the French, all of the Napoleon fans versus the one Swedish individual in the chat. <laughs> you know, the opinion on Bernadotte really differs based on whether you're Swedish or not. I, I, I mean, I like Bernadotte. Uh, I, I mean, I don't know. I think the idea of Bernadotte being a traitor is sort of, uh, like, overdone, to be honest with you. Yeah, Light, <laughs> Light's preparing to write an essay about Bernadotte now. Yeah, yeah, I agree, Ethan. Uh, all history, I mean, it's not really big in academic history anyway. But it, it can be a decent way to ask certain questions about if things did happen, if things had to happen the way they did. I agree. I agree. Uh, the hate against Bernadotte is, is so overdone. So overdone, really. 
I mean, and he did a pretty good job with Sweden, if you ask me. Um, yeah. I don't know. I think alt history can be interesting. I, I'm just, not, I'm not big into alt history necessarily. Um, also, like, one of my, one of the issues with alt history is there's just so much World War II alt history. Like, if you go into alt history, there's just so much... What if the Nazis won? And it's an interesting question, but god damn, that, that question is asked a lot. <laughs> I gotta say. So, I don't know. I'm not super big into alt history. I, I really don't think Bernadotte did a good job with Sweden at the cost of his honor. I really don't think so. Um, I don't think Bernadotte was that bad at all. I gotta be honest. Companies. The individual mercenary was thus usually recruited by a mercenary captain, and not directly by the ruler. In some cases, the mercenary captains also recruited additional fighters, specifically for a particular commission. Mercenaries could be some of the most efficient troops, but they were also very expensive and had a tendency to spark quarrels. Still, if one could afford them, they were a valuable addition to any army. With these additional troops, all major sources of soldiers had been tapped. Now, the men called up and recruited prepared themselves as best as they could and marched to join the army. After what was often a long and arduous march, they arrived at the place of assembly and reported for duty. If everything had gone according to plan, the king would look upon an army of men who had flocked together for a great many, yet very similar motivations. His vassals and retinues, the militiamen, mercenaries and support troops were ready to go to battle. Don't worry, Shad. If you're planning We're done. to raise your own army anytime soon. Oh, and here we go. If you're planning to raise, he knows this video is going to be used as a how-to. So please you're raise your army modern responsibly. Are usually not obliged to enlist for armed service. Please use the information provided responsibly and consider giving us a share of your spoils by joining the host of our Patreons. All right. Brilliant. That's us done with this video. Now, you can start giving your recommendations for what we should do next. Um, plus, I, I, you know, I'm pretty sure, like, the whole... It's not like Bernadotte left for Sweden. Like, Napoleon was fine with that. And then he served his responsibility as the monarch of Sweden. Um, did the Ottoman Empire or the HRE face major language issues with raising armies? Uh, the HRE didn't necessarily, because, you know, it's all Germans... Um, and we talked about the Ottoman Empire's professional, professionalization, um, efforts. And so, like we said, it was a slave-based levy where they, they taught them Turkish and I believe Arabic. So no, um, the Habsburgs could have some language. The, honestly, if you want to talk about having issues with ethnic diversity within your empire, uh, the Habsburgs had a big issues with that many times. All right, let's see. Perfecting siege warfare. Yeah, you've recommended this video before. It, it looks an interesting one to me. Perfecting siege warfare. Kings and Generals and Lucian. Okay, that's a good callback to something we were doing earlier. Tamil People by Kogito. Okay, that's a bit of a departure from what we're doing. Kings and Generals and Basil II. We, we really can't help ourselves but return to Rome. <laughs> We really can't help ourselves. <laughs> Harry just wants a, a generally, uh, just a video by kings and generals. Respectable. Very respectable. Uh, okay. Hundred Years' War by Kings and Generals. The Six-Hour History Speedrun of Byzantium. 
Uh, yeah, no. Okay, Kings and Generals has a whole series on the Hundred Years' War. Okay, we're probably not going to do that. Hmm. 38 minute war from Harry. I don't even know what that is. The 38 minute war. And then Kings and Generals and Lucian. Rome episode six. I mean, I'm I'm up to Rome episode eight on the Patreon, um, and we couldn't do a live reaction to Rome anyway, um, because it'd get blocked immediately. The good thing about Kings of Generals and Lucian is that it's <laughs> only 13 minutes, so we could probably get through it in only like three hours. Um. All right, you know what? I think I think we learned about the An Lushan Rebellion. I think we learned about the An Lushan Rebellion. Uh, and we'll see how much time we have afterwards. And then we can decide... If we have more time after, then we can do something else. And we have a couple of options for what to do afterwards. Yeah, doing a live Rome reaction is a quick way to get our stream taken down. First embassies to Rome from India were also sent by these southern Tamil states. Ooh, Shad's our guy if we want to do crossover Roman Indian history, which I know literally zero about. All right, and Lushan Rebellion, one of the bloodiest conflicts in history by kings and generals. Oh yeah, Roman also lied about how long the video was. Um, so uh, this is something that I don't know much about, um, but we have an expert in chat. Roman is our expert, an expert Chinese historian. So, he can fill us in if we need any education. Um, I'm excited to... Uh, that's fine, Roman, that's fine. But you, you do have to fill us in in, in all this sort of stuff. Um, so, we will be doing this. Kings and Generals, great channel. All right. Let's start with the An Lushan Rebellion. We have our expert, Roman Doyle, here. You need uh, an expert in Chinese history. Contact him. Let's get started. The middle of the 8th century was a period of profound turmoil across Eurasia, from the Carolingian unrest in 751. God, look at the Avars. Look at the Avars. You know, we I feel like we don't talk about the Avars enough. You know what I mean? I mean, we're always talking about the Bulgarians and, you know, but the Avars, they don't get enough attention. They were a big threat to the Byzantines for a while. Uh, hello, Shaheen. Shaheen's here. Glad to see a channel member. Hey, if anybody would like to see exclusive content, you can check out the Patreon or become a channel member. Uh, and if you would like, you can, uh, you know, leave a super chat, a donation, anything like that. If you would like to support the channel, I'd be very grateful. Hello. Glad to see you here, Shaheen. Um, all right. Everyone's saying they don't know anything about Chinese history. Good. Then we'll all be learning something by doing this. Um to the Abbasid Revolution of 746 and the Tibet. The Abbasid... Uh, we're, we're touching on so many interesting points. The Abbasid Revolution. Uh, I just, uh, yesterday, I think, released my reaction to Epic History TV's new video on the Abbasids. You know, we, we did our early Muslim expansion series, um, which is still going on, just very slowly. Uh, and, you know, we're doing the Rashidun and Umayyad caliphates for a long time. We finally got to cover the, uh, uh, the Abbasids a little bit. Uh, we'd covered them a little bit in the past, but, so, th that's related to something else we're doing. 
Tibetan Rebellion of 755. However, the most devastating of these upheavals was undoubtedly the Anlushan Rebellion in Tang, China. All right. This cataclysmic but lesser known conflict ended the High Tang Golden Age and resulted in the deaths of tens of millions of people. Holy! Welcome to our video on the Anlushan Rebellion. But before we jump to the video, allow us to say thanks to the sponsor of this video, World of Warships Blitz. This free-to-play game available on Google Play and the App Store. The Abbasids, they made great target practice for the Mongols. Hey, they also ushered in an Islamic golden age of culture and learning. You know, they hey, there's there's good with the bad, you know what I mean? <laughs> Installing the game from our link is the only way to get this bonus. Just, you know, sifting through the World of Warships Blitz ad. <laughs> After a period of disunity lasting over two centuries, China- Man, China always be disunified. I mean, this was one of the sort of jokes of, uh, history of the entire world, I guess. You know, let's- we gotta check back in on China to see is it unified or has it split and you know at times twas unified at times twas split china finally began its reunification in 581 when the sui dynasty overthrew the northern zhou by 587 sui had easily crushed and subjugated the smaller western liang afterward they struck south invading the southern chen dynasty by 589, China had been reunified for the first time in centuries since the fall of the Han. Though the dynasty's Whoa. reign was short, a number of key aspects of future Chinese civilization were instituted during it, including the Grand- Look at the Sui Dynasty, were they based Roman? That's my question. China's disunity is interesting because it is a major complaint by Confucius whose ideology goes on to obviously be very important. Yeah, this is true. I think we've talked about this, um, this aspect of unity. Um, yeah, for those that don't know, Roman is an expert Confucian scholar. So if you have any questions about Confucius, he is absolutely the guy to go to. Canal, rebuilding the Great Wall, and the construction of more public works. However, the strain of unification and these momentous achievements also caused discontent to grow. The final straw was a series of costly and unsuccessful military expeditions into Korea, which finally broke sway. Yeah, Roman, you should be more active in the Discord. You can share your Chinese history knowledge with us more often. You know, we don't have too much uh, chat about Chinese history in the Discord, but I feel we could use more. Um, power. Despite this, it has been said that the Sui laid the foundation for the greatness of their eventual Tang successors. Wasn't China super disunified during the times of Confucius? Yeah, but it's like a, you know, it's like a Thomas Hobbes situation, right? Like Hobbes lived through a time of great chaos and lack of political authority or non-royal political authority in uh, England. And so what did... Thomas Hobbes write about? Well, he wanted the ultimate absolute authority, Leviathan, you know. I mean, our environments influence us in various ways. Yeah, and, you know, you have Roman, Roman's expert confirmation. Rebellion finally broke out against the Sui in 613, and one of their most experienced generals, Li Yuan, was dispatched to modern Shanxi with an army in order to defend the capital. In 615 and 616, he moved north and destroyed some local bandit groups, as well as repelling a Turkic incursion. Despite his efforts, rebellion soon spread across the country. And as reports of the mounting anarchy reached Taiwan, Li Yuan's advisors encouraged him to seize power. In Confucius was not... Yeah, well, Roman, I, I wasn't comparing the ideologies of Confucius and Hobbes. I was just making the point that one's environment uh, influences how you think. Um, 
Uh, in his eyes, society was at its most functional. You would have loyalty to your family over political authority. Right. Okay, got it, got it. In 617, he marched south and successfully besieged the capital as Chang'an. I, I know you always say Roman that, you know, the one issue with Confucius is that he's not authoritarian enough and you wished for a sort of Leviathan-type scenario. I know that's what you always say, Roman, constantly. Installing a puppet emperor for a few months, but then elevating himself to the position after popular acclaim, finally establishing the Tang Dynasty in 618. Over the next century, China attained its highest territorial, political, and cultural position yet, and many scholars consider this period of the High Tang to be a golden age, just slandering Roman in public now. <laughs> Tang, high culture. Was it truly a golden age of China? No idea. During which China was probably the most powerful and wealthy state in the world. Whoa. The Eastern Turkic Khaganate was subjugated in 630, followed by its Western counterpart in 642. With these victories, the Tang- Whoa! Look at the Tang expansion! My goodness! They're, they're wrapping around Tibet. And you know, this builds up. The one thing I know about the Tang dynasty is the Battle of Talas. Talas, Talas. With the Caliphate. And obviously that means that the Caliphate has to extend remarkably far east, and China has to extend remarkably far west. We can sort of see that happening over this time period. Tang gained unquestioned hegemony over Central Asia and the prosperous Silk Road caravan cities in the Tarim Basin. Mm. It also successfully expanded into Vietnam and Korea, rising above uh. the failures of previous dynasties. In the bustling... So is this when China did a lot of its expansion throughout Asia? Or were they already influential? Because I know that as we go on throughout time, countries like Korea, Vietnam became very culturally and politically influenced by China uh, up until quite recently, if you look at it on a broad scale. It always amazes me how separated ancient China and India were despite their close proximity. Yeah, I can't speak much on that because I don't know much about ancient Chinese or Indian history, but it, it does seem a bit odd. I guess, yeah, Himalayas. Tang era set up most of the cultural and political institutions that would last all the way until the Qing. Wow. And this is one of China's expansions. Okay. Interesting. Cities of China, writers such as Li Bai and Du Fu created some of the most revered poetry in the ancient Chinese lyrical tradition. While beautiful paintings and expertly crafted pottery were created and even exported throughout the world. To do this, a quasi-modern export industry was developed, where Tang craftsmen would produce goods for specific markets, such as bowls inscribed with Islamic symbology for sale in the Muslim Caliphate to the West. Wow. In the bus <laughs> There's the tidy little Roman Empire. <laughs> The little brother in this instance. We have the gigantic, powerful Abbasid Caliphate, the massive Tang Chinese Empire, and the tiny little Roman Empire. Oh, look at the tiny little Roman Empire. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, obviously, Buddhism was a major cultural export from India throughout a lot of Asia. <laughs> y'all are y'all seem upset about my my Rome my Rome slander. I mean, it's not really slander if it's true, is it? I hate to say, but uh, you know, Rome not looking that impressive on this map. I don't know. I don't know. We've got the the Roma booze upset. I mean, of course, we've got Shaheen here. I don't want to dig it in too far, but the Roman Empire looks bad. Uh, 
The Persian Empire looks even worse, because it's not even there. <laughs> Another barbarian pretender. Well, I mean, I am Scottish, which means we were, we were, Frank, we were beyond the reaches of the Roman Empire. So, you know, even, even further, even more of a barbarian, I guess. Filling markets and streets of the imperial capital of Chang'an and other large Tang cities, Indians, Persians, Arabs, Koreans, Syrians, Sogdians, and... Right, and of course we saw that the Sassanid Persian court after it had been thoroughly defeated by the caliphate, kept fleeing east and fled all the way east to the Chinese court. And they were put up by the Chinese court for a certain amount of time. Ah, uh, yes, th this is true, Light. This is true. Well, there's a big, like... I mean, it's kind of silly. There's a big, uh like, thing, not big, but sometimes you hear from, like, Scottish people or other people, like, we were beyond the reaches of the Roman Empire, which isn't, like, I don't think that's necessarily, uh, that's not really bragging rights, in my opinion. It's a little silly. Um, I mean, I guess, well, I don't technically know where the hell my ancestors were at that time, but if they were lowland Scots like myself, then you are, you are correct. They would have been within the Antonine Wall, though past Hadrian's Wall. I mean, not that it really, not that it really matters that much. Of course, Britain was. Uh, I, I I I mean, you know, if we talk, if we're looking at like modern day Scotland, Rome didn't have really firm control over it, but Britain was one of the first provinces to fall away. <laughs> um, though, of course, there was a far stronger Roman presence in modern-day Ingerland. And others functioned as merchants and worshipped in their own manner, tolerated and encouraged by the High Tang aristocracy and monarchy. Yeah, Roman, give us... Uh, give us... Give us some insight on this. So I know that the, the Sassanid court, what was left of it, fled to the Tang Chinese court, and they were even funded by the Tang Chinese. Seems like this was true for a variety of foreign nobles. They came to the Tang court, and the very wealthy Chinese court, you know, was handing out the cash money. Do you have any insight on that? Because that, that's something we're a little familiar with. Ethan being here today is a clear sign his ancestors were civilized in the past. I mean, I, I guess at some point we were. <laughs> Okay, our China expert Roman doesn't know about that. That's fine, that's fine. It truly was an age of gold, but it was not to last. Uh-oh. As Emperor Xuanzong came to the throne in 712, the Tang Golden Age reached... Yeah, I think Roman's just being modest, pretending he doesn't have insights on this particular thing. I Yeah, and it seems like the Sasanians were the, the biggies among them, especially because, I mean... It wasn't just that a representative from the Sasanian court went to Tong, China. It was like the remainder of the Sasanian court because, you know, they didn't they didn't have an empire to rule anymore. So that that's got to be a pretty big deal, of course. It's apex. The early part of his reign was the period of greatest creativity of the dynasty, and many of the greatest aforementioned works of the period were created in it. This all changed in 736, when Li Lin Fu was appointed the chief minister. At the same time, Xuanzang was influenced by religion and his favorite courtesan, and became less interested oh. in ruling. In 742, Li Lin Fu conducted a series of purges, getting rid of the most talented potential adversaries at court. Uh oh I mean, look, that's, a, that's sort of a double-sided sword. You want to get rid of your most talented adversaries so they're not there to threaten you, that's fine, but uh, what that means is you're getting rid of your most talented bureaucrats and leaders, so who's going to govern the state? <laughs> you know, just, just something to think about. You know, I understand in court politics, purges happen. They're, I suppose, necessary sometimes, but, you know, make sure you don't get rid of all the talented people in the court who you need to actually govern. Yang Guifei slander, absolutely disrespectful. Oh, okay. Roman Roman has some insight on this. 
by 747, he was the de facto dictator. Arguably the... <laughs> a very, a very, you know, serene outlook on life from light. Governing is overrated. It's the journey to governing that matters. <laughs> Yeah, government is the friends we made along the way. I'm sure that's going to work out for everybody. <laughs> oh, she was the courtesan in question. People blamed her. But it, yeah, well, this is often what happens when you have prominent or even just like known women in history. If something starts to go wrong, it's like, well, it can't possibly be the emperor's fault. It must be that woman, his courtesan or his lover. What has she been? She's been poisoning his mind when... You know, oftentimes there's absolutely no evidence of that. Just an easy scapegoat oftentimes. The most damaging of Li Linfu's policies was that of exclusively employing non-Chinese generals as military governors. By entrusting armies to men with no political ties to the court, he hoped to prevent rivals from rising to power. However, this also meant that the army commanders were less loyal to the central government. One of them was An Lushan. Ah, uh, the Gok Turks. Uh, we see them in history of the entire world, I guess. You know, just absolutely bashing the Tang Dynasty. It was even less intelligent than that. They were just mad he liked her and were like, she shouldn't have been so hot. <laughs> what a what a reservation to have. And here we have An Lushan, our I guess main character. A general of Sogdian and Goturk origin. Wow, S Goturk and Sogdian. I always think Sogdian's a funny word. I'm sorry, I can't help it. Um, interesting. As one of the most powerful frontier commanders, he commanded a 164,000 strong army in the northeast. Whoo! My God! We were just talking about how in this period of European history, the amount of men that could be mobilized in Western Europe was not impressive. We cut over to good old Anne Lushan, and he's got 164,000 men. My goodness, we are, we are, you know, this is Chinese history. <laughs> we we're talking in the hundreds of thousands and millions. I mean, it makes sense given the casualty toll that I was informed of earlier, but pretty impressive. East and had his headquarters near modern-day Beijing. He was responsible for controlling the nomadic Kitan people and other nomadic tribes in the Manchurian region. In addition, Xuanzang and Li Linfu gave him unprecedented favor, appointing him to high-ranking offices, giving him the rank of prince and uh -oh. the right to mint coins. What the hell? <laughs> That's more than just a success. The right to mint coins. They were giving this guy everything. They're like, all right, you're a successful general. We're giving you all these positions. You can mint coins. All right, just hand him the keys to the office. What's going on? Meanwhile, Emperor Xuanzang's favorite mistress influenced him to appoint several of her kin to important government positions. Oh, I don't know, Roman. You're you're trying to defend this woman, but uh, she, uh, she seems to have been a pernicious influence. I uh, I don't know. You might wanna you might wanna change your opinion, buddy. Yeah, we talked about earlier the, the 60,000 men raised during the First Crusade versus 164,000 men just in one frontier army in China. Crazy, crazy. As the late 740s progressed, one of these family members, Yang Guozhong, began to make alliances with the enemies of Li Linfu, challenging his power. He also began conspiring to remove his courtly rival's ally, An Lushan, from his command. The situation became even more dangerous in 752 as Li Lin Fu passed away. Yang Guozhong took control of the imperial court and sought to eliminate An Lushan. Ooh. The reasoning for what occurred next is debated. It could be that An Lushan felt threatened in his position by the fickle court in Chang'an, or that he simply We really can't know what she actually did. Uh, sh yes, she didn't leave sources of her own, and she was incredibly unpopular, so we only really know what people said about her. As I mentioned earlier, that like a lot of prominent women throughout history, unfairly demonized, because, you know, of course they're not able to 
leave their own opinion and they're easy scapegoats. Yeah, I, we don't really know truly. Um, Chinese historian Chao Jukua wrote this about the South Indian Chola Empire. When fighting these elephants carry on their backs houses, and these houses are full of soldiers who shoot arrows at long range and fight with spears at close quarters. That's fun. <laughs> Simply designed. You read it from the middle. Uh, Alright, that's all I'm seeing in my chat. Let me quickly... Uh, yep. Re resend the first paragraph, because I am not seeing it. The chat can be funny sometimes. withdrawing west to the impenetrable Tong Mountain Pass with what remained of his army. Um, all right, the first paragraph, there you go. This Chola country is at war with the Kingdom of the West of India. The government owns 60,000 war elephants, everyone seven or eight feet high. My goodness. Okay, I see. Obviously a lie, but hey, it's something. Yeah, I mean, look, a lot of especially ancient history numbers um, or just numbers throughout history are exaggerated by historians. You know, historians up until the modern era have loved their exaggerations. So, you know, we take everything with a grain of salt, but still suggests a very large force of war elephants. The Chola Kings also had an all-woman bodyguard unit. Okay, that is interesting. That's a very rare thing. I mean, women serving in a military context. Um, I'd be very curious about what exactly uh, the deal was with that. Feng Changqing was then joined here by another experienced general, Gao Shangji, who had recently returned from Central... Hey, the Battle of Talas. Uh... The one thing I know about this period of Chinese history. Roman, who's your who's your favorite general from this period? Because I, I know nothing about any of these guys. Asia after being defeated at the Battle of Talus. A few months later, Luo Yang surrendered to An Lushan. He entered the city and treated the surrendered Tang officials there with respect and dignity. Oh, well, that's nice. An act which caused many of them to come over to him. Oh. At the dawn of the year 756, An. Roman. A Roman being modest again with his Chinese history knowledge. Uh, Cholas also invaded the Indonesian Empire of uh, Srivijaya and befriended the Khmer Empire of modern-day Cambodia. Huh? And Lushan declared himself emperor of a new Yan dynasty with Luoyang as its capital. Wow. As the main rebel army prepared to march on the Tong Pass, where the loyalists had entrenched themselves, 
An Lushan dispatched other prongs of his army to the northwest and northeast. His northwestern advance thrust towards the bend of the Yellow River in order to secure strategic territories in the region. His eastern deployment was far more critical. As his army had initially dashed south to capture Luoyang, he had not secured the marching path with garrisons or pledges of loyalty. Due to this, pockets of Tang loyalist resistance began to spring up on the path from Fanyang to Luoyang, cutting- Uh oh, his, his empire's getting cut off. Come on, An Lushan. You started this whole thing, what, what's going on here? Uh, yeah, we have chunky Tibet at this point. And, and yeah, Confucius is so pissed off right now. <laughs> he hates to see it. And then the Cholan invasion of Indonesia. Indonesians tried to mess with Chola trade routes to India, so the Chola went to the Indonesian king. Went to give the Indonesian king a good spanking. Uh, okay, it's China. Ding An Lushan's connection to his home base in the north, and consequently delaying his attack on the Tong Pass. By the summer of 756, An Lushan had regained control of his home territory and turned in Chang'an's direction once again. Concurrently, Emperor Xuanzang made two catastrophic tactical errors. Uh -oh. Furious at Feng Changqing and Gao Xuanji for their inability to defeat the rebels, he had them executed and replaced by a sycophantic subordinate. No, not my boys, what the hell? He then ordered this new commander to abandon their strong defensive position and attack An Lushan's force immediately. The attempted frontal assault turned into a disaster when the army was led into an ambush and destroyed on July 9th after marching through a narrow pass. The way to Chang'an and the imperial capital was open, and there was now nothing to defend it. It seemed as though the new Yan dynasty had won. The few survivors of the massacre in the mountain pass fled to the west and reported what had happened to the emperor. Mm. Alarmed at the news, Xuanzang and his heir Suzong fled the grandeur of the imperial capital. Two weeks later, as they reached a relay station, the- <laughs> Yeah, th this guy sucked. This guy was not a good emperor. I mean, you can blame the courtesan or whatever all you want. This guy, he's not doing a good job. During this time, the Tibetan Empire also sacked the Chinese capital of Chang'an. My goodness! The Tang Dynasty is just getting absolutely screwed at this point. The royal entourage was turned on by their soldier escort, and Xuanzang was forced to execute many of his bureaucrats, who the soldiers blamed, probably correctly, for the disaster at Tong Pass. Mm. After placating his warriors, <laughs> Xuanzang... F yeah, okay, Roman. You're, you're putting yourself in his position and saying, mm, I would have done the same thing. Get your mind out of the gutter, buddy. You have to run an empire. Fled south and eventually reached the city of modern Chengdu in Sichuan province, while his heir advanced north and approached Lingzhou in the autumn of 756. Three days after his arrival, Suzong was persuaded to usurp the throne from his exiled father, who was granted the title Shang Huang or retired emperor. The Tang's longest and most glorious reign was at an end. Meanwhile, An Lushan's main rebel army entered and occupied the capital at Chang'an, reportedly massively depopulating the city in the process. It is not known if he massacred a great portion of the city's population or if the disruption simply caused many to flee, but the- When talking about great female leaders, Lady Fu Hao is the GOAT! She led many military campaigns, commanded 13,000 soldiers, and was one of the most powerful military leaders of her time. I've never heard of her, but sounds absolutely fascinating. The formerly glorious city was greatly diminished by this part of the war. From his new base in the northwest, Suzong began to gather forces to him. In 757, he decided to borrow troops from both the Abbasid Caliphate in the west wow. and the newly ascendant Uyghur Khaganate in the north. Wow, how about that? 
I mean, the Tang had been fighting with the Caliphate. Now he's borrowing troops from them. He's getting troops from the Abbasid Caliphate and the Uyghur Khaganate. Remarkable to fight off this rebellion that has uh, gotten way out of hand. Or just to fight off An Lushan, honestly. Who likely prospered from Chinese trade and did not want it to be damaged or were promised privileges after the rebellion had been quelled. At the same time, perhaps frustrated by the inability of An Lushan to successfully advance either west to the Tarim Basin or south to the Yangtze in the face of increasingly stubborn resistance, a group of his immediate followers assassinated him oh. and installed his son. And this is how it goes. Killed from the inside by your own people, you know. I mean, it seems like he was slowing down, but unstoppable until a betrayal from the inside. And Ching Shu in his place. However, this coup led to the weakening and implosion of the burgeoning Yan dynasty, enabling the Tang to strike back. With the assistance of newly gathered frontier forces and their new allies, the newly enthroned Emperor Su Zong marched south once again and regained the twin capitals of Chang'an and Luoyang from the rebels. The existential threat to the Tang dynasty was over, but the victory had been won at great consequence. The effect of the rebellion on China had been utterly devastating, it is not known how many Tang subjects perished as a result, but the death toll is... Zheng Yi Shao commanded 17,000 pirates, 226 ships, and 1,300 cannons. Holy! 17,000 pirates! That is a truly remarkable number of pirates. That is, that's an operation, that's an army of pirates. And then Lady Fu Hao particularly remembered for executing uh, the earliest recorded large-scale ambush in Chinese history, which is quite remarkable, and not bad for being one of the 60, 60, wow, wives of the Chinese emperor. Yeah, not bad at all. He estimated to range from 15 million to 40 million. As the loyalists had been forced to withdraw both their generals and armies from the frontiers to fight the rebels, their border defenses also collapsed with armies from Vietnam and the surrounding region attacking the undefended Damn. Canton region, maintaining control over it for- Yeah, they had just recently invaded places like Korea and Vietnam, dominating them. Now Vietnam's turning the tables. They're, they're all right, we're going, we're, uh, you want to invade us? We're invading you while you're down. Half a decade. In 763, the Tang's long-standing Tibetan rivals took advantage of their weakness and briefly occupied ah, Chang'an. And this is what we're talking about. They, someone mentioned this earlier. They, Tibet occupied Chang'an. How about this? A powerful Tibetan state, uh, a chunky Tibetan state, able to take advantage of the Tang weakness before they were forced to retreat. The Tarim Basin and Northwest was permanently lost, along with its rich horse-rearing pastures and wealthy oasis cities. Aww. During the rebellion, An Lushan had also seized the Grand Canal, cutting off the flow of grain, cloth and money to Chang'an. Uh -oh. Furthermore, after he had seized the capitals, the imperial government lost all of the granary contents and the wealth in its treasuries. As a result, the previously prosperous realm was now in dire need of funds and began selling titles and positions. Bruh, <laughs> losing all the grain, starving your people, mal moment. <laughs> Talk about a mal moment. <laughs> China really has a thing about, uh, you know, losing all the grain or in some way starving out their people. 20 to 30,000 civilians eaten. What is going on in the chat? What is going on? Why are we eating 30,000 people? The siege of Sui Yang during An Lushan. Why did they eat so many people? This is insane. Which had before been occupied by skilled and examined bureaucrats. 
this situation was not helped by the fact that the old taxation and land system completely collapsed in the rebellion. Soldiers were hungry, can't blame them! <laughs> as many tax rolls were destroyed oh, no. or became obsolete due to the massive casualties and amounts of civilian displacement. You're not yourself when you're hungry, I should have just bought them Snickers. The last embers of Yan Rebellion were not extinguished for another decade, and the impacts of this conflict would plague the Tang Dynasty for the rest of their reign. Damn. They would rule for another 150 years before the unified China once again fragmented, but would never again reach the heights they had achieved before the rebellion of An Lushan. Damn, An Lushan kind of messed it up, huh? Alright, I am looking up this siege, because I think it deserves a, a moment. Siege of Suiyan. Um, there we go. Alright, well, we're doing some classic Wikipedia reading. Um, you know, don't, you know, blah, 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 Wikipedia, not an academic source. Yeah, whatever, I just want to read about this quickly. Okay, during the An Lushan Rebellion, launched by the Rebel Yan Army, right, to capture the city of Suiyang from the Loyalist Force... Okay, so, we know about this, this is in context, what we were just watching. <laughs> the large, okay, Tang Army's determination to fight to the last man, and the large-scale cannibalism... Alright, honestly, we don't need necessarily all the background. I'm just particularly interested in the cannibalism aspect. Okay, so we have a prolonged siege and a prolonged state of famine. Um, if Suiyang falls, Yang will be free to conquer the rest of southern China. Okay, a seriously important city. Besieged the city for a long time. Uh, I'm trying to skim through this. More troops. Sick and hungry. Ugh. Order them to eat the flesh. Afterwards, what the hell? Afterwards, they caught the women in the city. <laughs> when there were no more women left, they turned to the old and young men. 20 to 30,000 people were eaten. People always remain loyal. They ate the horses. When there were no more horses, they turned to the women. 30,000 people were eaten. Nobody rebelled. When the city fell, only 400 people were left. My goodness. And Roman says the... Oh, okay, right. And that, that's what we just read. He took his concubine out and killed her in front of his soldiers in order to feed them. Jesus Christ. This went so bad. Like, so badly. <laughs> I can't... <laughs> okay. I mean, look, uh, a big siege causing famine and death is not a rare thing in history. But, uh, Jesus Christ, cannibalism on that scale. Also, yeah, taking out your concubine and having her eaten. Which he thought, oh, they're gonna, they're gonna love this. They're gonna find this super inspiring. Alright, we're gonna do one more reaction. So, we have Perfecting Siege Warfare. That was, uh, we're gonna skip... Basil the second for now. Um, we also had Tamil People by Kagito. Yes, which Shad is shouting out. Um, do we have any other recommendations to add? That is my question. Right now, we have Perfecting Siege Warfare and Who Are the Tamil People? Does anybody want to add another recommendation? The First Crusade by Epic History TV. Um, okay, I mean, 
we we'll probably won't do that because for uh, that'd be a good reaction to do otherwise. But also, I've already done a whole Kings and Generals series on the First Crusade, so I don't necessarily want to go over the same content. And we're only going to do one more uh, video today, one more reaction. We'll have to save the rest for next time. Persianization of Alexander the Great. That's a good reaction. I think that's a reaction that I want to... Or, well, you know, we'll save Persianization of Alexander the Great for later. Because that, that's a reaction I, I, I have actually been wanting to do. So... We will do Persianization of Alexander the Great. Um, okay, so here's what's going to happen. Um, I'm going to put up a poll. And then I'm going to uh, take a break and go to the bathroom. And while I'm doing that, y'all can decide uh, which reaction. And then one is perfecting siege warfare by, that's another Sand Roman, Sand Roman. Uh, or who are the Tamil people? Who are the Tamil people by Kagito? No, Persianization of Alexander is a good choice, but I think I'm going to do that at some other time. So, here are your guys' options. Um, perfecting the Siege Warfare by San Roman, or Who Are the Tamil People? I'm going to uh, take a break, and I'll be back in, like, a shortly, a minute or two, hopefully. All right, I'm back. All right. Let's see how our poll has gone. All right, uh, we've got 13 votes. We've only got 11 people in here. I'll give it like another minute. Uh, it looks like we can see which way it's going to go. Uh, looks like Perfecting Siege Warfare has won. Uh, <clears throat> and I, 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 uh, let me say, I'll do Persianization of Alexander the Great. Uh, either as a filmed reaction or maybe in our next live stream. But that is one that I do specifically want to get to. Um, our next uh, like actual video, or it's either next or the one after next, 
is on Alexander the Great's speech, you know, his, you know, best speech in history or whatever. So we're doing more Alexander content. Um, all right. Pull over. Uh, we will be doing perfecting siege warfare. Uh, I see in the chat that, yeah, this is true, Shad. You always lose the polls. <laughs> Maybe you should, Chad, maybe you should advocate for the option you don't want to win, because then that one will lose. Maybe you and Light have to switch places. <laughs> no, I mean, I think it's because Light is generally advocating for the option that uh, the audience is more familiar with, like a lot more Western history, um, which they generally vote for. And then Shad usually wants us to do some Asian or Indian history in particular, which I think my audience is a little less disposed towards. But, you know, I try, I try to fit it in every once in a while. Um, epic. Oh, wow. Epic History TV did a version of the speech in ancient Greek. Uh, I do not speak any ancient Greek, so I react to the English one. But, hey, if anybody here speaks ancient Greek, then there, there you go. Everything on the list, Ethan will get to them before you all, yeah. I have an absolutely ridiculous list of reactions to get to, but some of them I, I prioritize over others. Um, and, you know, if you join the Patreon and subscribe at uh, the, I think it's the Professor tier, um, you know, you can get priority reactions, because it takes me so long to get to these damn reactions, it really does. All right. Getting around um, one. Oh, my goodness. That was accidental. I think this fits the... I mean, look. Uh, we're doing another Sandroman reaction. Um, perfecting Siege Warfare. And Light mentioned has mentioned this one before. He recommended this before. Um, and he gave, gave us a little bit of info. Sebastian Le Prestre de Vauban. Um... I find this interesting, once again, not necessarily in my area of expertise, but a little before it, kind of around the same area. Um, I can also see in my recommended Extra Histories New Napoleon series. Anybody who's excited about that, those reactions will be coming soon-ish. By soon-ish, I mean maybe a week or two. But that is sort of the next series I, uh, I prioritize doing. Because I always love more Napoleon content. And you guys, God, you guys love more Napoleon content. <laughs> like, you, you really, really do. Marshal Vauban, the Chad. All right. I'm excited. Let's get into Perfecting Siege Warfare, our second Sandroman reaction of the day. Um, I enjoyed our first one, so let's see what this one has to offer. Name, Sébastien le Prêtre de Vauban. This My God, listen to the French pronunciation. When it comes to siege warfare, there is no getting around one name. Sébastien le Prêtre de Vauban. Sébastien le Prêtre de Vauban. My goodness. I'm still not that good at the uh, the whole French pronunciation. So 1633 to 1707, uh, an interesting time period. Like I said, a time period that isn't necessarily what I study, but right on the edge. We're talking early modern history. We're talking, if this is France, which I think it is, we're talking Louis the Fourteenth. we're talking the Sun King. And this will be useful for Roy Dean. He's learned how to raise a medieval army. Now he can learn how to perfect siege warfare. I'm sorry, Shad. I'm sorry. I know we, we do a lot of European, Western European history. I, I do try to... I've, I've been trying to add in a little more variety lately. We've been doing more Asian history lately on the channel. But um, if, I, if I give the audience a vote, then they're probably going to vote on doing... <laughs> Uh, more Western history. <laughs> um, I don't worry. They they don't really like American history either. So I don't I don't get to do much of that. 
uh, is sort of a particular interest, but we'll we'll do more uh, more Asian, more Indian history in the next time, uh, in the long term. So keep keep that video you wanted to do. <clears throat> all right, Shad's not complaining. I I know he enjoys all, but keep 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 more of those Asian or Indian history videos uh, and and recommend them next time. Um, we should do Ottoman history. Hey, I I love Ottoman history. Uh, I haven't done much of it, but. Yeah, if, if you guys would like to see more Ottoman history, then I, I really enjoy Ottoman history. I don't know what sort of Ottoman history there is uh, on YouTube, but I, I definitely enjoy it. This French military engineer changed the face of siege warfare profoundly and lastingly. He designed the most resilient fortresses ever seen up to his times and developed a nearly infallible offensive siege routine. When Vauban entered the stage of history in the middle of the 17th century, France was in a predicament. Spain and the Dutch Republic had both honed their skills in the 80 Years' War, a conflict in which most military action consisted of sieges. The French, however... Oh, yeah. Good point, chat. There's a series on Suleiman the Magnificent by Extra History. Yeah. I would very much like the dude extra history has so much good content it's crazy <laughs> like it is crazy how many good series extra history has and I would like to do all of them there's so like people have so many recommendations um there's so many ones I'd like to do but it's so <laughs> like I said I have so many reactions planned if I'm like okay I want to do Suleiman the Magnificent extra history series when can I fit that in Probably like two months from now like it's it's kind of crazy how backed up I am, but I would love to do that one day <laughs> I mean, I guess it's a good problem to have to have way too much content, but it is how it is PMF productions on their video about Napoleon in Italy mentioned Vauban when talking about the siege of Mantua and how Napoleon used his tactics Wow, okay, okay, uh, and a Kings and General series on early Ottoman history I mean, probably the, if you want to like request a reaction and you're not going to pay for it on the Patreon, probably the best chance you have is on a live stream. <laughs> but the issue is if you want to, if you want like me to do a series then I can't really do that on a live stream. Well, uh, well, we, we can do extra history series on the live stream because they're short. So maybe... You know, I don't know. Well, I'll consider. I, I do enjoy, you know, we did like two live streams where we just did Catherine the Great uh, reactions. And that was a great time because, you know, it's like condensed. It's not the same topic, but we have several videos to go through. So maybe we'll do something like that for Suleiman. I had to blow through most of my allowance in a fancy cafe today. I, <laughs> yeah, no, fair enough. No one has to support the Patreon or anything. Um, it's, it's just it's an extra thing. Um, history student reacts how not to pay hacks. <laughs> we get it. You want to rob us poor British working class peasants. Hey, now. Hey, now. We're all coming from the same position here. I'm doing my best to provide you all the content you want. <laughs> However, had been making little progress. Their style of assault, quote, amounted to little more than an ill-prepared storming of the work targeted for attack, end quote. As the expert for the French army in the Grand Siècle, John Lynn, puts it. Soon, headlong frontal assaults, often involving unnecessary losses, were known as attack à la Française, the French oh. way. Vauban Funny. was the man to bring about change. Not only did he bring France to eye level with its adversaries, but in fact he established a routine of siege attack that was to remain unaltered for almost two centuries. Even the manual Military Engineering Part II, Attack and Defensive Fortresses, which the British took to France in World War I, was still largely based on his principles. Moreover, Vauban perfected the bastion for- This is true, you, you Brits have your- uh, your cost of living crisis right now, which I think is pretty tough, but 
I gotta say, uh, I feel like I, a shockingly high percentage of my audience is British. Now, I know English speaking makes sense, but when I, uh, when I look at who participates and comments and all that sort of stuff, you know, I ain't seeing that many Americans. I'm seeing a lot of Brits. You know, you guys, you guys chat a lot, so, you know, contributors. It was still largely based? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Hey, Roman got us to do On Lushan. That was good because we talked about it earlier, so it was a bit of a callback. And, and Light is promising to, uh, uh, to recommend some Asian history next time. And Shad was peer pressured into spending a lot of money at a fancy cafe. <laughs> yeah, maybe that, I mean, I don't know. I, I have a lot of Europeans, a lot of Brits in particular watching. Um, and I think it might, I don't do much American history. I do a lot of European history. Maybe that's why, but it's sort of a cycle, which is, when I do American history, it doesn't get many views, so I don't do it, which I imagine only attracts more Europeans. I, I like American history, though. I really do. Um, and I guess, I mean, we haven't done too much British history either. We've done a lot of mainland European history, a lot of Roman history, obviously, French. Um, I'd, I'd be willing to do more uh, British history uh, if people wanted to see it. We'll see, we'll see. Um, but I'm not quite sure exactly. I, I don't know. I don't know that much about British history, to be honest, so I can't really add too much to it versus if I was, in the times I have done American history, I have done... I, I can add a quite a bit more perspective. Ford and equipped the French border with a line of fortresses that repeatedly proved their worth up until Napoleon's times. Vauban was the first military engineer to ever rise through the ranks, thereby wow. paving the way. So that's pretty key because, you know, engineering, of course, is a very key part of uh, military and military history. And as time would go on, Engineering, and I'm talking about specifically a early modern European context, because you go back to a Roman context, and it gets like, you know, a lot of what they're doing is technically engineering, but it's sort of different than like modern engineering. But as we move closer to early modern than modern European history, engineering becomes more and more key to military affairs. And, you know, the engineer core, pretty important part of modern European history. Uh, if you ever get into doing U.S. Civil War content, recommend the channel Warhawk. Okay, okay. I will write that down. Warhawk U.S. Civil War. <laughs> and Harry's asking what history does America have, and, and Shad, Shad has his list ready. The Founding, War for Independence. You know, not to mention, uh, you know, pre-United States history. A lot of people start with 1776, but of course you can look at both the settlers, the colonizers. Before that point, there's a lot of interesting stuff. I study a lot of colonial American history. And then, of course, Native American history goes way, way, way further back. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff. But, you know, back to, back to Vauban and French siege warfare. Wait for a professional class of military engineers. This video is sponsored by Magellan TV, a rising star in the- All right, I'll, I'll, I'll let their sponsor play through even if I mute it. Um, yeah, well, the, the issue with Native American history, which Shad is pointing out, is that, um, especially in the longer term, we lack a lot of sources. Um, a lot of it isn't written down, and we have some oral sources, of course, but those can be pretty sparse and may not be as reliable as written sources. So a lot of the Native American history um, does have to be done basically through archaeology, um, which is still interesting, not necessarily my field, but... So 
but there is still a lot of Native American history to study. Um, and of course, some of that is the fault of the European colonizers. I mean, there are examples of uh, bodies of Native American history being destroyed. Some of it, of course, is just the lack of writing down written history. Uh, but there, there's still a lot of interesting stuff, absolutely. Hello, and start your free trial today. When Vaubon began his work, siege warfare had already come a long way. By the 17th century, it was a specialized form of warfare with its very own experts, strategies and methods. Fortresses were no longer cracked open by heavy bombardment or overran by storm assaults, but by extensive digging. Well, well, you know, people often think about the castles and siege warfare of the medieval era. But to my understanding, the better that castles and fortifications got, sort of the more we move out of the medieval era because it becomes less and less effective to launch an assault on such intense fortifications. And sort of the nature of warfare changes. Except when France is attacking. But even for them, the standard weapon to attack a fortress soon became the shovel. The average early modern siege began when the attacker encircled the fortress to cut it off from reinforcements and supply. This was usually done by two complete rings of entrenchment. Castles didn't stand up to cannons well. True. Well, that is true. And then you... Good point. The more that gunpowder gets involved... Um... Yeah, this is... <laughs> it's interesting. We have the development of these major fortifications and castles, which sort of move us forward. But then those castles and fortifications themselves become less relevant as we move out of the feudal era. And of course, there's... You know, you can look at the Ottoman siege of Vienna with the massive cannons they used. That was sort of a, a really important moment in the sort of use of gunpowder and cannons in modern warfare. Uh, but just, just as Light is pointing out, just politically, when we're, these local lords are becoming less important, no more local lords with local bastions, it sort of becomes a little less relevant. <laughs> yeah, Roman, this is not consistent with what we saw at Helm's Deep. <laughs> the contravallation facing inward to the besieged, and the circumvallation facing outward to protect the attackers against their elite. Yeah, Shad has been pushing the, the winged hussars this whole time. Uh, you know, we, we love our sabatons here. Then the winged hussars arrived. Ba -da -ba -ba. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, great track, great track. Army. Such methods had been used sporadically throughout history. Caesar's... Alicia! Hey! Hey! Caesar shout out. The, the two walls method. How about that? I did not think we were going to get a reference to the damn Battle of Elysia. God, it's almost a throwback at this point, because, you know, we, we do a lot of Roman history, we go through time. It's been a while since we did those uh, sort of earlier days of Caesar and Gaul. You know, we're, right now we've been doing a lot of Hannibal, um, you know, we're doing a lot of sort of later, like, you know, some Octavian, Augustus, uh... So it feels like a bit of a throwback to the good old days of Caesar in Alicia. The Republic hadn't fallen. We don't have the Caesarian Pompeian civil wars. He's, he's just fighting Gauls. <laughs> Pick this video solely for Caesar reference. <laughs> I mean, look, hey, you're appealing to the right audience. Good old days. I mean, it's really what I'm thinking back on is the good old days of the Historia Civilis reactions, you know? I mean, we've done tons of great reactions on this channel, and we're doing great ones right now, and there's more to come, but I gotta tell you, that, that series of, I think it was like 80 Historia Civilis reactions, God, they were so good. I mean, we did all of his videos, <laughs> um, and, you know that we're done until he releases a new video, then I react to it, but those, that series of Historius Villas reactions, those, those were great. I mean, people loved them. They were a great time to do. I love Historius Villas. Um, I mean, Historius Villas has his own particular biases. He really doesn't like Octavian. 
Um, and I know, I mean, we there's a new, I know there was a new Historia Civilis video on his Patreon, so we should have a new one coming out soon. And, you know, now Historia Civilis is, like, going to be primarily focused on Octavian, because he's, like, the new main character, so I'm curious to see how he can, how he handles that, because he doesn't like Octavian very much. Yeah, another video should be out within a week from Historia Civilis. Yeah, I'm excited for that. First Battle of Elysia might come to mind, but now they were standard. A complete circumvallation could be very extensive. When besieging Sertor and Boss in 1620... <laughs> Anti-Octavian bias is definitely one of those things dividing America these days. A shame to see him worsen that division. So true, Roman. I mean, when we talk about political polarization in America, we talk about Democrat versus Republican, right versus left, and pro versus anti-Octavian. The, the divide is truly terrible these days. <laughs> Historius Villas is usually careful with the sources. Uh, yeah, he, he seems to include a lot of really negative stuff about Octavian, regardless of if, you know we can confirm the accuracy of the source or not. He, ju he just doesn't like Octavian. He, he just doesn't like him. So he'll include negative stuff uh, as much as possible. Um, and, like, I, I partially I get it. Like, Octavian could be sadistic at times. He could be brutal. Um, you know, there are a lot of negative things you can present about Octavian, but I think, I, I like to think I have a more broad view, generally. Uh, he's a complicated character. <laughs> Thanksgiving just hasn't been the same since my grandpa went on that anti-Octavian rant. <laughs> Very true. The army of the Dutch Republic built a contravallation of 25 kilometers and a circumvallation of 45. Yeah, and I think this is true. I think Octavian lived in a brutal time, and Octavian was just someone who was willing to do what it took to achieve his goals. So he played into the brutality of the time, as many people did, and that is absolutely true. But I think, you know, if you look at Octavian's whole life, there is, of course, a lot of complexity. There, He was very talented, very intelligent. He did a lot of good. He did bad. So, I, he, for me, he's just a complicated character, right? Um, I wouldn't call myself pro or anti-Octavian, but in the same way that I don't... I'm not trying to moralize historical figures. I'm not, I don't view myself as pro or anti a lot of historical figures. I just view them as interesting characters with a lot of different things to look at. Octavian is the same way. I don't think he's, like, particularly awful, necessarily, but I think there were bad things about him, of course. And if you're judging alongside other Roman emperors, then, of course, Augustus is right at the top, you know? So, there's different ways to judge and, and, and different standards. The point is, I, I think, yeah, Historia Civilis is quite negative about Octavian, and I think it's unwarranted to a certain extent. Five kilometers. Walking around it was an 11-hour walk. The contravallation, the inner line, was the starting point for zigzag trenches towards the fortress. They needed to be zigzagged, because this way the enemy could not shoot along the trenches. The angles of these so-called saps became ever sharper as they came closer to the defenses. In addition, the attackers sporadically built redoubts where they could- We need to hold him accountable. <laughs> we need to cancel Octavian. <laughs> hold him accountable. <laughs> That's so funny. Or, no, you're saying we need to hold his story Civilis accountable. Justice for Octavian, I see. That's funny. Either way, funny thing to say. Um, yeah, okay. Let, let's move on from Octavian. We've talked about him plenty, and whenever we get that new Historia Civilis video, we'll talk about him plenty more. Let's, uh, let's return, get our brains back into early modern Europe. Vauban? Siege warfare of the early modern era. Come on, everyone, everyone shift, shift back to here. Could seek <clears throat> cover. This way, their trenches would worm ever closer to the walls. 
Now Vauban didn't invent an entirely new style of siege warfare, but he perfected the often messy and inconsistent methods. To do so, he made several changes. We obviously can look at each and every one in detail here, but we will talk about the most important offensive innovations. Parallels, ricochet firing and the Cavalier de Tranchée, which are elevated fighting platforms. Mm. Vauban first implicated his system of saps and parallels during the siege of Maastricht in 1673, when he took this major fortress in just 10 days and with much fewer losses than expected. When Vauban laid siege to a fortress, he also began building a contravallation, usually just outside the reach of the defenders, that is, between 2.8 and 3.5 kilometers away from the closest artillery position. It's interesting because a lot of this, a lot of this math, the lines of artillery, this is stuff that was and would remain very important to the European war strategy of the time. I mean, we think of, say, Napoleon, Napoleonic tactics, which I'm sure a lot of us know a little bit about. Part of the considerations when looking at what formation to put your men in was, okay, what would the line of artillery be like? How many men would it hit, etc., etc. So these are the considerations of the era and uh, they're only getting more important, of course. Uh, Zods really doesn't like Louis XIV. I, I, you mentioned that earlier. I, I, I wonder why. I mean, he is a uh, pretty important character. Yeah, this is really up in Napoleon's wheelhouse. From there, Vobo and his men dug approaches towards the fortress and then created the first parallel, equipped with batteries at about 600 meters. They then stepped forward to about 250 meters and installed a second parallel, where along others the ricochet batteries were placed, about which we will talk in a minute. The third and final parallel needed to be very close to the walls, at the base of the glasses. An Uh, okay, Shad, you've typed Louis uh, the Fourth, but I'm assuming you meant uh, Louis the Fourteenth, because that's who we're talking about right now. Um, I mean, it all depends on how you look at it, but Louis the Fourteenth was a very uh, yeah. Of, I figured you meant the Fourteenth. Louis the Fourteenth was a very influential French monarch, Sun King. Um, you might not like, the, the thing is, this is when we start mixing, like, morality with history. You might not like what he did, um, I mean, but just looking at it sort of more objectively, he was a very, he was a very relevant monarch. He's probably the stereotypical absolutist monarch, um, and he did a great job reining in his nobility, you know, Versailles, that whole thing, and centralizing power around himself, right? He really led the way in terms of these absolute monarchs, and he really built France into a strong, centralized, absolutist monarchy. Now, Louis the Fifteenth wouldn't, and Louis the Sixteenth wouldn't do so great with that, but that's really what Louis the Fourteenth built. Um, and so, yes, he is probably one of the, the greater French monarchs. He had a massive influence on French and European history more broadly. Um, like I said, he's seen as, you know, the archetypal absolutist monarch. His actions had influences on many other European monarchs who would follow in his footsteps. It's interesting, we have sort of the absolutist monarchs of the 1600s, Louis the Fourteenth is the archetypical one. Then we move to the next century, and you get the the brand new enlightened despot, the enlightened monarch. And in that century, the 1700s, uh, Frederick the Great is probably the model to follow, and a lot of people do follow him. Um, so yes, Louis the Fourteenth, very very influential. Um, and I don't know about Zod's. Uh, characterizing of him he he was a spoiled brat absolutely he was king um but and i don't know that much about his generals or that but looking at the political side of things louis the 14th was a master of politically manipulating his country 
and his nobility. I mean, that's what he really did. And yes, of course, that is the issue with centralized royal authority is, you know, when your king is good, you're good. When your king is bad, it's bad. But, in my opinion, this sort of centralization of power was a part of the modernization that Europe was going through at that time. It was a part of that process. Yes. We should focus on the siege warfare, but I, I would say, I mean, talking about Louis XIV, uh, I I'm fine with tangents. I mean, I'm fine with any tangents, but a Louis XIV tangent is obviously relevant to what we're talking about here. Um, but yes, that that's a little bit about Louis XIV politically, uh, and why he was so important, but now back to the military side of things. Official slope outside the ditch, usually at about 30 to 50 meters from the main wall. This last parallel featured the breaching batteries, heavy guns designed to blow a hole in the walls of the fortress by pounding against them over and over again. In most cases, all three parallels were reinforced with redoubts at both ends and used as defensive positions for the attackers and as valuable as... No rebels really came under him. Well, I mean... Yes, everyone should stop yelling. But there was the front of course, but that is very, very early in Louis XIV's life, and of course he didn't deal with the front, um, but it was something he witnessed, and it really influenced his mindset, um, but I, I understand the point you're making. Yeah, good and centralized bureaucracy, and of course that is what happened in Europe of the 16, 17, 1800s, as power was centralized into these absolute monarchs, then what happens? Well, you need to build a professionalized bureaucracy in order to administer your centralized state. It's, it's the trend of modernization one after the other. That's what's happened during this period. Roman's favorite monarch, David the Builder. Um... The greatest Georgian monarch, or one of the greatest Georgian monarchs? I don't really know. Uh, I don't really know. Maybe Roman could recommend a David the Builder reaction for next time. <laughs> Best monarch France ever had was Flavius Etius. <laughs> Interesting. I think we're, we're talking about a bit of a later time period. <laughs> Assembly points. Before the introduction of parallels, an attacker who wanted to attack more than one spot had to undergo the immense task of opening several trenches right from the contravelation, which made the point of it. But yes, Philip Augustus is obviously very important in sort of the entire history of France. He, he plays a real important role. Um, anyway, b back from comparing monarchs to this sort of siege warfare of the time. Attack predictable. Now, there were three additional lines stretching along the defenses. Where exactly an attacker would strike became clear only at the very last moment. This forced the defenders to spread their efforts. In some cases, for example at the Siege of Art in 1697, parallels even replaced the contravelation. Vauban's second offensive innovation was ricochet firing. To the consternation of the gunners who were used to batter against the walls with all they had and very much enjoyed the thundering sound of a cannon loaded to the maximum, Vauban mm. had some of them load their cannons with less powder. This way their balls didn't just sail over the heads of the defenders behind the parapets in a flat trajectory, but were rather loped over the parapet and then, ideally, bounced along the covered ways and ramparts, wreaking havoc among the defenders. This was made possible by the parallels, who allowed certain when was Napoleon the second? Uh, I don't think there. I mean, there was a Napoleon the third, if that's who you're referring to. He was uh, an emperor of France for a while. As a professional total war player, I feel like I'm already a siege expert. Yeah, that's exactly how it works. Batteries to be positioned sideways from where they could shoot along the defenses. While Vauban experimented with this as early as 1674, 
The first time he used it on full scale was also during the Siege of Art in 1697, in which he brought the use of artillery to perfection. The third innovation had a very similar purpose. The Cavalier de Tranché was a raised firing platform for infantry, built only 30 or so meters from the top of the glacis. It allowed attacking infantry to shoot along the covered way. Bobo emphasized these cavaliers as means to bypass the phase of the siege that was usually most costly in terms of casualties, the fight for the covered way. He thought of it as a means to spare the life. Yeah, Roman, a huge Georgian and Chinese nationalist. Yeah, I mean, Napoleon, the actual Napoleon II, you know, didn't have much influence. Um, yes, titular disputed emperor of the French for a few days in 1814, as, you know, everything was sort of crumbling for uh, Napoleon Bonaparte, but Napoleon III would sort of reclaim the name. Of course, you know, there's differing opinions on him as well. Lives of the attackers. So, no mind warfare, regular viewers might ask. Yes and no. Indeed, Vauban experimented with mines multiple times, but he was not too enthusiastic about them, and by the time he had completed his work, it took an exceptionally obstinate defense to prompt the attackers to go to the trouble of digging mines at all. Wow, he didn't like mining and sapping. Historically, such an important part of siege warfare. Interesting. It's all Sakart Velo. <laughs> Typical Kartvelian. Even if everything goes well in a siege during this era, you'll still lose a third or half of your force to attrition. I mean, look, attrition was tough, man. You know, it's uh, a dangerous... Dangerous game to play, I'll put it that way. And yeah, mining, mining and sapping. Fascinating parts of siege warfare. I find them very interesting. <clears throat> Zods can't wait for John the Goat Churchill to kick ass during the War of Spanish Succession. Oh, good old, good old Spanish Succession, eh? Don't, uh, don't, don't you love the uh, the seventeen hundreds? Just so many wars of succession: Polish, Austrian, Spanish. I mean, Bavarian. They loved them. They loved them. By applying Vobol's methods, a well-defended fortress could be taken in about 45 days. Practice largely confirmed this. Lille fell in 51 days, Luxembourg in 37, and Namur in 36, to name but a few examples. Wow. In the past, it has been argued that none of these innovations were actually innovative, and that is, in some sense, true. Damn. Parallels and elevated firing platforms had been used by Ottoman siege masters before although not exactly in the same way. Yeah, I mean, when you're talking about... I, I mentioned this earlier, first movers in terms of siege warfare of this era, the Ottomans are a good place to look to. But of course, the thing with the... It, it's a little complicated, because the Ottomans are... Of course, they conquer a good chunk of Europe, but they are still kind of on the frontier of Europe, not to mention that the Ottomans peak... And they start to decline. <laughs> so, you know, you start looking back towards Western Europe, countries like France, as we move into the 1700s. Yet, before Vauban came on the scene, the siege attack was an indiscriminate and senseless chaos, a labyrinthine accumulation of dangers and countless trenches. Vauban adapted, reorganized, and structured what he found. His true achievement was systematizing siege warfare and thereby creating a method which was almost foolproof. He himself promised in one of his treaties, quote, I guarantee an infallible success without a day's extra delay if you will defer to my opinion and follow faithfully the rules I lay out, end quote. Indeed, if it was followed intelligently while ample resources were available, the fortress under siege was almost certainly doomed. But while Vobol's methods undoubtedly saved lives, they were prodigal with other resources. He calculated the 20,000 men were required to besiege even... Yeah, no, don't, don't worry about it, Shad. You speak... <laughs> you speak English very well, my friend. <laughs> 
I think it's just a spelling from Harry, I guess. In a modest fortress. And accordingly, mountains of food, ammunition, and other siege supplies were needed. In fact, sieges following Bourbon's principles were so costly that the French rarely conducted more than one at a time. This led to some clashes with the king, the minister of war, and high-ranking field commanders. Mm. Especially when armies grew bigger in the late 17th century, such decision makers were more willing to trade lives for time and resources. Mm. And to make that clear here, Vauban's role was primarily to counsel and implement. The decisions were made elsewhere, namely by the king himself and the minister of war. Vauban's offensive methods quickly became the standard procedure for attacking a fortress. But he was also known for boasting of having, quote, worked out an infallible method of defending a fortress as well. Hmm. However, he never found himself under siege and actually died without ever writing. Eugene of Savoy, yes. We, uh, he was brought up very briefly in our series on Frederick the Great. But at that point, he was already sort of old and, and past his prime. But to my understanding... Uh, Eugene of Savoy was once a great warrior. I don't know too much about him, though. Uh, so did Count Dracula, Vlad, Vlad Tepes. Dracula, son of the dragon, because his father was Dracul. And then you have Vlad Dracula. Um, of course, where the name Dracula came from, though, according to Bram Stoker, or at least what we know, the vampire Dracula was really not based too much on Vlad Tepes himself, the name was the main thing taken. Well, it's uh, Son of the Dragon slash... I think some have also said Son of the Devil. But the Dracul, it comes from... Uh, it was an order... Goodness, you're really drilling my my knowledge from a couple of years ago. I believe it was an order established like by the Pope or some sort of Christian authority for that Vlad's father was a part of the Order of the Dragon Dracul. Um, and you know Dracula, son of the dragon. And yes, Vlad, Vlad did love to put his enemies on pikes. Spikes. He was a brutal character, but, you know, a lot of the... I mean, he, he was a brutal character, but I will tell you, some of the atrocities of Vlad Tepes have been exaggerated. You know, he, he did some brutalities against the German Protestants of his kingdom... And those German Protestants went back to Germany, the German states, and printed a bunch of propaganda against him, which is some of the stuff we know today. But he, he did like to spike people through. That is absolutely true. But uh, some of the brutality of his actions may be a little exaggerated from centuries of propaganda. Um, and he, he, he was a brave, he fought bravely against the Ottomans. Yeah, yeah, I think I think that might be true, Roy Dean. Um, Skure Horror o Ob Ob joined. Yep, yep, yep. You joined the live. We are on our third reaction of the live. My goodness. Um, yeah. He bravely placed citizens on pikes. Well, that part of it wasn't necessarily brave, <laughs> but you know, I'm saying he was a tough anti-Ottoman fighter. down or stating any of his alleged strategies. Nevertheless, he did perfect the bastion fort and has therefore contributed more to defensive siege warfare than anybody else. To this day, fortresses all along the French border bear witness of his famous capability. He bro oh, wow, okay. <laughs> you guys are just dunking on Vlad Tepes right now. I don't know there were so many anti Vlad Dracula people here. <laughs> I don't think that Vlad Tepes necessarily played a big role in the history of the region, to be honest with you. Um, like, he, I, his actions did not change too much. He was sort of a frontier fighter. 
he was not necessarily of that much importance in the grand scheme, as Shad is pointing out. But, you know, he's still an interesting... I mean, he's an interesting character, though, of course, most of the fame attributed to him comes because of now his association with the vampire Dracula. <laughs> Roman giving us his deadliest warrior knowledge. You know, we still have to do that at some point, you know, Roman. Ah, Dennis is here. Yes, you have you have missed quite a bit. You have missed quite a bit, but you've come in time for about half of a video on perfecting siege warfare. I mean, Roy Dean, I would give him the forgotten award, but uh, he's been remembered because of uh, Bram Stoker, basically. Yeah, this summer, Roman, this summer. No, I, I think... Uh, after this, we're going to be done, Shad, because that Who Were the Tamils video was 26 minutes long, which would mean probably, like, two more hours of content, which, you know, I, I ain't doing that. <laughs> we're going to get through this and probably be done. Yeah, you can all, yeah, you can rewind live streams on YouTube, unlike, yeah, YouTube strong. I don't really care about YouTube versus Twitch. I mean, I, I would would never stream on Twitch anyway. As a fortress builder. All right. So we looked at infallible sieges. Now we're on to Vauban's three systems. And then the last part's about France more generally. Obscure <laughs> horror. Yeah. Common YouTube W. Yeah, hey, feel free, Dennis. Uh, stick around if you want and go check out uh, one of the videos. It's all good, it's all good. Bobo would certainly not be too happy with all the historians, including us, who discuss his achievements as three systems. Oh. Although he emphasized structure and method in offensive siege warfare, he deeply despised rigid systems when it came to design of fortifications. He insisted, quote, the art of fortification does not consist of rules and systems, but uniquely in good sense and experience, end quote. Okay, interesting. So this is the perspective of the guy himself. Uh, have a good night, Dennis. Have a good night. I uh, hope you enjoy that video. Um... The art of fortifications does not consist of rules and systems, but uniquely in good sense and experience. I feel like that's not really true. <laughs> I, I, I mean, we are literally talking about his three systems. Like, there is definitely a system to it, Vauban. I mean, maybe we should be listening to him because he's the expert, but he I feel like he's saying that because he had that sense and experience, but also this system which he had developed slash perfected. In fact, Bomo thought it absolutely essential to adapt to terrain and harshly criticize those who build fortresses as designed on a plain white piece of paper. Mm. But for this- And I think that's fair. Like, obviously you have to be ready to adapt to the situation and build around whatever scenario you're dealing with, but that doesn't mean that you can't have a system. It just means that you have to be practical along with having a system or a certain way of doing things. For the sake of simplicity, I'm sure the great engineer would make an exception as long as we make clear that the three systems are nothing more than useful categories summarizing retrospectively what he was actually doing. Yeah. For most of the fortresses Vauban designed, he simply built on a straightforward, well-proportioned version of the Trace Italienne, designed by Blaise François Pagon, a great engineer under Louis XIII and major influence on Vauban. This was Vauban's so-called first system, <coughs> the core elements of a Trace Italian fortress, a bastion fort, that is, where, in his eyes, the bastions, which formed a set of mutually supporting strong points, were merely connected by the curtain wall. The decisive factor in making these strong points effective was the distance between them, which was the effective firing range of a musket, that is, 125 yards. Oh, two, uh, I see what you're saying. Two hours left on eight minutes. Yeah, I, I, I don't think so. 
<laughs> I mean, we've gone about three hours. I'm hoping to end this live stream before the four hour mark. Um, as we usually do. I don't know, maybe we'll start the next live stream earlier in the day and we can go longer, but there's only a certain amount of time I can go for, plus I'm getting really hungry at this point. Uh, but, you know, we'll finish this video and then uh, I'm willing to go a little bit longer. This way, musketeers on both bastions could cover the whole ditch between them. In addition, Bobo made use of all known outworks, demi-loons, hornworks, crownworks, and so on. The one thing he did change on the Bastion Fort was the adaption of a part of the Dutch so-called Fools Pre. This is a lower wall just beneath the main wall. These were also called Tene and screened the assembly of sorties. Goodness. Ah, oh, the old Belisarius reactions. Those are, ah, man, I talked about the Historia Civilis reactions, the Belisarius reactions. Those are good ones too. Get a Deliveroo then, Ethan. You know, non-Brits wouldn't necessarily get that, but I get it. Um, we don't have Deliveroo in the U.S., but I, I, I understand. Um, no, I'm, when is the next live stream? Well, I don't have it scheduled yet, but... <laughs> Deliveroo in this economy. <laughs> um... I don't know. I'll have to take a look at my schedule and decide when the next live stream will be, but maybe in a week or two. Well, Zods, we have other delivery services, you know, your Uber Eats and your DoorDash and your Grubhub. We just don't have Deliveroo in particular, but I understand that it's a, a British delivery service. Yeah, Chad isn't familiar either. Um, I, I don't know when the next live stream is going to be. Probably not next week. Maybe two weeks from now. I don't know. Uh, it, hey, if y'all want to stay updated, then what you should do is, I mean, first off, keep an eye on the channel because I always announce when, uh, I'm having another live stream. And then also... Check out the Discord. That is a link to our Discord server. Hey, if you want to keep up with uh, when the next live stream is happening, when videos are coming out, if you want to talk about history, uh, check out the Discord. How about that? Now, we talk about a lot of history in there. It's a good place to be. Good place to be. Yeah, Roy Dean, I think Shad understands the concept of food delivery. <laughs> he just didn't know what Deliveroo in particular was. <laughs> I am almost 100% sure that they have delivery services in India. Yeah, yeah, exactly, Shad. <laughs> uh, nope, nope, the Discord is absolutely free. Um, if you are a patron or a channel member, you do get access to exclusive channels in the Discord, but joining the Discord itself is completely free. You can just click on the link and join. And yeah, I need to scroll back and chat. Roman is giving the absolute fair shout out to Wawa. Big, big Eastern Pennsylvania W. I mean, if we're talking about regional things, that, that's even more regional. <laughs> Most people here are not going to know what Wawa is, but and any any Philadelphia area people will relate. Or, I guess if you're in Florida, they have them in Florida now. Um, uh, yes, anyway, yeah. Hey, anyone in chat who wants to join, I, I just put the link in chat. Join up with the Discord, please. It's a, it's a good place to be. Anyway, back to Siege Warfare and provided a low, secure firing position. Vaubon masterfully applied known methods according to the requirements of time and terrain. One thing that particularly puzzled Vaubon were hills. A fortress dominated by neighboring heights was at a significant disadvantage, as became evident, for example, in the Siege of Ostende, where the Spanish could easily shoot over the parapets of the defense from a platform in the dunes. Vaubon found a solution for this problem. 
he placed the main artillery in a small sturdy tower and detached the bastion from the main wall. This innovation was known as his second system, the Tour Bastionné. Yeah, look, Shad, don't, you know, don't come to America for curry, you know what I mean? America doesn't know nothing about curry, my friend. Curry powder, I guess just to make curry easy for Americans. Uh, you know, I mean, America has a very diverse food landscape. We've got a lot of good food here, but Indian food is not... You can get good Indian food in the United States, but it's not that popular. Indian food is real popular in the UK. I know that much from, from living in the UK. But Indian food is just not that big a thing here. Good, good, good reference, Roman. Good, good reference. <laughs> or Bastion Tower. Vauban explains, quote, In essentials, the Bastion Tower is a very strong retrenchment. They only know McDonald's and K- Bro, you do not want to get into a food competition with America if you're Britain. Yeah, okay, go back to your damn jelly deals. We've got great food from all around the world. De Mexican food? Oh my god, we got good Mexican food. <laughs> True. Yeah, come on. We've got we've in chat right now. We've got Americans, Indians, and Brits. If we're having a food competition, Britain is at the bottom. I hate to tell you. Yeah, Britain has some good dishes, but it's just no competition with the United States. Uh, yeah, Amer We have tons. We so many options in the United States. Oh yeah, India though. India does have great food. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, a re yeah, repeat of 1776. <laughs> this is exactly what happened. America said, we don't want to eat jellied eels and beans on toast anymore. Please let us go. We want to have, you know, good Mexican food and fried chicken and southern food. Uh, and pizza, and hoagies, and oh my god, American food is so good. Yeah, we're, we're restarting the revolution again. Which is capable of putting up a powerful resistance after the detached bastion fort in front has fallen. In any ordinary fortress, when the bastions are breached, the whole ensign is breached. This cannot occur in a new system, where only the individual work actually under attack is at risk." End quote. Hitherto, the bastion had been the most obvious point of attack, because an attack on the curtain wall meant advancing under the crossfire of two bastions at the point usually shielded best by outworks. The bastion tower changed this and made it significantly more difficult to attack the bastion. Vauban, sometimes choosing odd analogies, described this creation as, quote, pulling out the nose in order to throw it in the... F Bro. Harry, man, y'all are not competing with America over pizza. That that's just is not a competition. We, if we're talking about Italian food, UK versus US, man, we have got you guys. Now look, I, I, I Britain has some good dishes. I don't deny that. Um, I love a good meat pie. I love a sausage roll. Uh, a full English breakfast. It, absolutely, I'm not denying that. I mean, I grew up in Scotland. Um, I'm just saying, uh, in terms of food generally, America wins that battle. Oh god, now we have the, the pineapple on pizza debate emerging in chat. We really went in a, a food direction. <laughs> Face of its enemy, end quote. Bastion Towers were first introduced in Bessançon, Belfort, and Landau in 1687. They were very effective and could be applied on almost any site, given that considerable funds were available. The third system was only implemented in one fortress, his defensive masterpiece Neuf Brisach in Alsace. This place was fortified in 1689 and is one of the better conserved Vauban fortresses. As you see here, the Bastion Tower was complemented by a recess in the curtain wall. You know, we've had plenty of historical debates, some political debates, and now it, it gets really heated is the, the food debate. Pineapple on pizza. Even, <laughs> even during Rome's most 
chaotic times, they never put pineapple on pizza. Yeah, I'm not a, look, uh, I'm not that passionate about it, but I am not a pineapple on pizza guy. I gotta, I gotta say it. It's not my thing. But, I, I, I don't think it, I, I don't think it's that big a deal, you know. I really don't care if you want to put pineapple on pizza. I see why some people would like that. It's not my thing. The curtain wall featured its own little shoulders, so to speak, in which casemates, fortified gun emplacements, or armored structures that were used as firing positions could be placed. The, that's what I'm saying, Chad. You, you're, this chat is filled with wrong opinions. It's a chat full of Brits. You don't go to Brits for food opinions. If you go to Brits for food opinions, that's where you've gone wrong. <laughs> Yeah, and this is a great point from Roy Dean. Some other creators, they do, they live stream their reactions and then they turn them into videos. I can't do that. <laughs> I thought about doing it, but I mean, first off, you can just see the live stream on the channel. So you might as well just do that. But also we go on so many crazy tangents that I'm like, I'm not even going to bother trying to turn this into a full video. <laughs> In addition, Vauban gave the Ravelines fully covered redoubts, making it harder to be hit from above. Neuf Brisac <laughs> was probably- <laughs> Brits, will... <laughs> Brits will be like, mmm, you gotta try some diddly smackers. And then his peas spread across breaded sardines. <laughs> yeah, like the, the wigged kebab. Oh man the pinnacle of bastion forts. However, nobody took this system up after Vauban's death because casemates fell into disrepute and the costs of remodeling the curtain wall would have been overwhelming. Neuf Prisac alone consumed an enormous 4 million livres. All right. I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna try and focus in on the last chapter. Chapter three, the great fortress called France. Let's return back to Vauban. Although Vauban despised war, he thought it a necessary evil. He saw, as John Lynn puts it, quote, predatory foes across the frontiers, surrounding a beleaguered France, end quote. As he perceived the European environment as very hostile, he thought a fortified frontier to cover all fronts would be necessary, the so-called pré garé In 1673, he wrote to Louis XIV, quote, I do not like this pell-mell confusion of fortresses of ours and the enemies. You're obliged to maintain three for one. Your men are plagued by it. Your expenses are increased and your forces are much diminished. That is why, be it by treaties, be it by a good war, you should round off the borders." End quote. Whenever possible, he advocated this strategy and proposed to Louis which fortresses should be seized and which abandoned. The king was fond of Vauban. Well, I mean, that's actually an interesting point, Roy Dean. It really depends on what your circumstance is. Because if we think about sort of the late Roman Empire, a lot of fortifications are built during the late Roman Empire because it's getting more and more dangerous. And as we move into the late, late Roman Empire, the fall of the West, they, they can't manage to upkeep some of these forts. So they either just let them be sacked or they pay off raiders. But, counterpoint, you come to the early modern era and we see a country like France under Louis XIV, which is centralizing and modernizing. You know, Louis has more and more resources that he himself can utilize, not only through his lords, but just directly through his royal government. And so for him, it's worth it to build up all of these um, fortifications. It's just an interesting look at, you know, centralized authority. views, and soon the Pré Carré became a direction of strategy. Vauban was most concerned with the northern frontier, where eight fortresses received entirely new walls or citadels, and 23 were significantly renovated. There, Vauban built a double line of fortresses resembling an army arrayed for battle. These fortresses withstood the test of time. The frontier was not broken through for decades. 
Although the northern frontier was the centerpiece of Vauban's ambitions, he fortified all of France over time. Two lines stretched from southeast between Lorraine and Luxembourg and along the Rhenish frontier, while the major roads from Italy through the Alps were protected by a set of fortresses near Briançon. <coughs> the defensive line continued all the way to the Mediterranean and an additional line stretched along the Pyrenean front. Rounding off the borders included both adding and removing fortresses. Mm. In addition to conquering and building new fortresses, old and unneeded ones had to be destroyed. This was necessary because an unused, badly maintained or undermanned fortress simply invited the enemy to seize it and would offer them a defensive position at the French border. Apart from strategical purposes, this cut a- Damn, Roy Dean, you are forsaking your own country! <laughs> Roman Britain was dead weight, he says, dead weight! Um, but, I mean, yes. I mean, look, when you get into the late Roman Empire, you just get to a point where the empire is so disunified, so chaotic, that, you know, whichever emperor is in charge literally cannot muster the resources to defend all available territory, and Britain was pretty far out, and it was already at risk, so they, you know, they let it go. Uh, UK is 1707 is when the Act of Union is signed with Scotland. ...expenses and relinquished significant numbers of men for service in the field armies. By deliberately constructing and destroying fortresses, Vauban created a frontier that shielded France way beyond the reign of Louis XIV. In the 1790s, it protected the young republic from monarchical Europe. Yeah, this is absolutely true. And so we can see the long-term influence of Vauban. His fortifications, uh, and this is what we're talking about, Shad. We're talking about the fortifications that uh, surrounded France that Vauban played a big role in. Of course, these had lasting impact, including defending France, defending the revolution when it was at its most vulnerable. His... <laughs> History student reacts to inedible British cooking. <laughs> Just beams on everything. <laughs> That's funny. Ew, yeah, we are not... like, And this is why I can't make them into length videos. We are not starting this again. Um, n not a chance. That would We'd probably be going for another two hours at that point. In the early 1800s, Napoleon was well aware of how much he owed to Vauban's fortress walls. And even in the Franco-Prussian War in 1870, Vauban's fortification could still give a good account of themselves. Wow. After Vauban had conducted his last siege at Breisach in 1703, the old engineer was put out to pasture. In a long and hard-working life, he had equipped France for generations with reliable defenses and brought it from the headlong attack à la Française to cutting edge siege methods. Yeah, honestly, I was gonna say, Shad, you shouldn't be too upset that we didn't do your video because we it would have gotten no attention. Light recommended this video <laughs> only for us to not, like we went on so many damn tangents and I think Light is gone. I haven't seen him in the chat for a while because <laughs> we didn't give any attention to the actual topic of the video. I mean, look, to be fair, we, we talked about Louis XIV for a bit and we talked about Vauban, we gave him a bit of attention, but we had so many crazy tangents. His work was admired and copied all over Europe, and the military engineers that followed in his footsteps were frustrated by the quest of finding a reliable method of defense against the Vauban-style attack. Vauban had established a nearly infallible routine, applicable by any man with a decent understanding of siegecraft, and the will to become versed in it. When he mm -hmm. died on the 30th of March, 1707, he had sustained eight wounds, directed 48 sieges, and drawn up projects for about 160 fortresses. This great engineer had established his immortality in a more concrete form than probably any other human being since the time of building of the pyramids. Really? Wow. If you want to establish your immortality. That's quite a claim. Oh, they got so many good videos. I don't know about that. Irish axe mercenaries. Sounds like someone I know. Um, the Great Siege of Malta, 1565, fascinating, but we really, really don't have time for that. Um, that's our last reaction of the day. Uh, I'm willing to hang around, 
Uh, yeah, Roman, correct. <laughs> uh, I'm willing to hang around and chat for a little bit longer. So uh, if you guys have any uh, other historical topics you want to talk about, or uh, any topic, food topics, whatever, any other tangents you want to go on, now is the time. Um, we're going to chat for a bit, and then I'm going to end the live stream. Um, so that, that's our last reaction for today. But any, uh, any, you know, any topics you want to bring up, I'm sure you've already brought them up. But any other topics you want to bring up, bring them up now. Uh, I mean, Zod's a lot of people like Ireland, you know? Uh, I think it, I've never been. Seems pretty nice. I know a lot of Americans love Ireland because uh, a lot of Americans have Irish ancestry, so they want to return or, or, or go visit. You know, uh, pe people like Ireland. It's got a pretty good reputation, I guess. Uh, speaking as an India, I mean, I imagine you mean Indian, is $10 good for an Americano? As in, like, the drink? <laughs> the coffee? Uh, I don't know, it sounds kind of expensive, I guess. I wouldn't be, I mean, I'm not a coffee drinker, really. I ain't spending 10 bucks on it. Ah. A small cup. Yeah, it seems a little expensive. I don't know. Um, but, I don't know. If it's a fan... I'm, I assume you're talking about your fancy cafe experience. If it's fancy, then I guess that sounds about right. Uh, I'm not saying I don't like Ireland. It's not underrated. Yeah, I, I don't think it's necessarily underrated. I don't know. I think Irish history is kind of underrated. I mean, I feel like we don't talk that much about Irish history, to be honest with you. I don't think I've ever done Irish history on the channel. There's one for the list. Do some Irish history. <laughs> By the time of Aetius and Majorian, large parts of northern France uh, had already fallen to the Germanic tribes. Yeah, massive parts of Spain had fallen, not to mention Africa. Yeah, I mean, it was a disaster. The, Ro the Roman Empire was falling apart. Absolutely falling apart. We only ever talk about Irish political history. I mean, on this channel, we haven't even talked about that, but... I mean, yeah, when we do talk about Irish history, we basically talk about... Honestly, like, the famine forward. We talk about the famine. Uh, we talk about, like, Irish independence. We talk about the troubles. Like, these are the couple of topics that get... I, I, I know what you mean, Roman. I know what you mean. I was just saying, we, as in this channel, don't talk about it at all, but when people do talk about it, it you're exactly right. It's like those three modern political topics. The rest of Irish history doesn't get much attention. I feel like, um... Uh... Something that's interesting about Irish history that I, I don't know much about, but I know that, you know, basically after a certain point, all of the Gaelic... Uh, aristocracy left Ireland and spread out throughout Europe. I know a lot of them went to France. There was this sort of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Emigre Gaelic aristocracy. Um, I don't know anything about it. I've just heard of it before, but that sounds like a super fascinating topic. I always think when you have a court or a aristocracy that's been displaced from their country, you know, that's a real fascinating thing to think about. <laughs> yeah, H Harry clearly has a lot of uh, British patriotism or nationalism. Uh, I guess you might you might call it. Oh, I didn't get my my arrows in on time. Um. <clears throat> Harry identifies as a lefty, a nationalistic, uh, imperialist lefty. Hmm. Interesting combination. 
but you don't mind imperialism. How can you be a lefty that doesn't mind imperialism? They seem, uh, those things seem to clash. I feel like being a leftist is sort of pro, uh, I mean, I guess it what, uh, depends on what kind of leftist you're talking about, but I, I'm pretty sure leftists in general is more pro-autonomy, pro-independence, you know, that sort of thing. <laughs> Yeah, we had some great chats this stream. The food tangent was a great one. Uh, I think, uh, you know, we arrived at the correct conclusion, which is, uh, you know, American food absolutely destroys British food. Um, but of course, we have Shad here. Indian food, excellent. I love Indian food. Um, I mean, there's, look, there's a lot of countries with a great food, you know. I, I'm not, I mean, I'm a little, I'm a little patriotic, but, you know, I... I don't hold America above all. There's a ton of great... I mean, look, Mexico has great food. America has great food. India has great food. Italy has great... I mean, so much great food out there. And when I make that list, man, Britain ain't on it. <laughs> Britain is not on that list of best food. I hate to break it to you. I hate to break it to you. Uh, yeah, Chinese history, truly wild. We go through the Anlushan Rebellion, the same time that European countries could only mobilize like 10k guys. You have like 30k people being eaten during a Chinese siege. You have tens of millions of people uh, dying in a rebellion. All right, I'll stop. <laughs> I'll stop. Go. I'll stop rambling on about food. Um, America does have great food, but um, you know, a lot of countries have great food. That's it. Um, yes, very productive discussions on siege warfare. <laughs> As in... Uh, w well, you know, during that video, we did have some productive discussions on Louis XIV. Uh, we didn't really talk about siege warfare at all. A little bit. A little bit. We gave it a bit of attention. We just had so many tangents. I mean, at one point, we literally ended up on a pineapple on pizza tangent. That is the most random... The most random tangent we've ever had on the channel. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, American food is pretty bad for... I mean, the thing is, you have, like, American food, as in, like... Uh... Like, American, like, burgers and shit. And then you have, like, American food, as in the food within the United States of America, which is very diverse, of course. Um, but, I mean, yeah, a lot of American food ain't good for you, but that's not why you ate it. Of course, you need, you know, we all need to learn a bit of moderation. Yeah, Alicia. We did get a, an Alicia shout-out, which completely, like, d derailed us, and we ended up talking about Caesar and Octavian. Uh, yeah, I mean, the McDonald's, that's American. I mean... McDonald's might be America's biggest single cultural export. But, I mean, I don't necessarily <laughs> view McDonald's as my representation of American food. You know? I mean, I think that's what foreigners think of. You know, like McDonald's and KFC and stuff. But if I'm, you know, get, you know that's not where I'm going to go for great American food. Ford... Ah, uh, yeah, maybe, well, I don't know. Ford versus McDonald's, which is the biggest American export. That's, a, that's, a, that's one to wonder about. Zary Moft. Yeah, yeah, we got very sidetracked during this stream. I mean, we did a lot of history, but we ended up on a food discussion somehow. I think I'd have to agree with Roman. I really think it might be McDonald's. <laughs> Do you live in Nuts, Ohio? No, I don't. Um, but my buddy, my buddy Seamus, Roman will get this reference. He just arrived in Ohio literally today, unfortunately. Um, but no, I don't live in Ohio. And I've never been to Ohio. Thank the Lord. I don't plan on going either. Yes, Sh Shad once again lost a poll 
Uh, this is what always happens. But I think Light pledged... I mean, Light, I think, is gone because <laughs> of all the tangents. I think Light pledged to uh, support some Asian history next time. <laughs> no, hi yeah, what if I did that next on the channel? Ohio history. <laughs> what a direction, huh? I don't think there's anyone out... Well, I was gonna say, I don't think there's anyone out there doing Ohio history, but Chris, from Vlogging Through History, he is from Ohio. And he talks about Ohio quite a bit. So, if you... Look, if you want Ohio history, this is not the place to come. Go to Vlogging Through History. He does Ohio stuff. I... I yeah. I do not live in Ohio. I'm a Pennsylvania boy. Pr proud Pennsylvanian. Not Ohio. Even when I lived nearby the Ohio border, I never once went to Ohio. Yeah, VTH has some really good... Um, uh, like in-person videos. I, he has great reactions. He's got great in-person videos. And yet, VTH Chris tries not to mention Ohio for one second challenge. Impossible. That, that man loves mentioning Ohio. Uh, but it's where he's from. It's where he's from. <clears throat> yeah, and VTH recently won the whole uh, debacle with CGP Grey, right? Um, I mean, it's mainly because the next step for CGP Grey was to take it to court. And I guess Gray didn't want to do that, so he just left it. Um, but, you know, VTH doesn't get his channel deleted, and he gets his videos back, which is good. But, you know, this is why I, I don't do CGP Gray reactions. Uh, Epic History's Ranking of U.S. Presidents. That's a video I really want to do, because... That's one of those videos that gives you a springboard that you can jump off from to talk about history far more broadly, you know? Like, that would be... I don't know. I think I'd want to... I might want to do a reaction video to... Like, an actual video to react to Epic History TV's U.S. President's ranking. And then we could do a stream where we rank U.S. Presidents. You know, we did a stream ranking uh, Roman Emperors... So I think at some point in the future, I would love to do more ranking videos. Of course, we have, like, best generals ranking. Um, but I think, for me, one that I would know a bit more about is a, uh, you know, U.S. Uh, president's ranking video. Yeah, me and, me and Roman have ranked U.S. presidents one time. Um, but it'd be fun to do live on stream, I think. And Shad says just get to Germanicus. Yeah, um... I don't have my... Germanicus is coming. If I can pull my schedule up. Um... <laughs> Europeans try not to fall asleep during American History Challenge. Impossible. Alright, I, I can give you guys a, a sneak peek of what we have coming up. So, next week is some sort of miscellaneous reactions. Then the week after that, we start Napoleon in Egypt. Extra History TV's... Or, sorry, Extra Histories, new Napoleon series. Um, so that's, like, two weeks from now. And that'll go for, like, two, three weeks. And then after we do uh, Napoleon in Egypt, the next series is Germanicus, Avenging Varus, by Invicta, I think. Um, so there you go. Uh, this is not true, Roman. <laughs> this is slander. And once again, it's not a competition between American and European history. I like both. I really do. Uh, I'm, I'm a fan of, uh, I'm a fan of all kinds of history, but, you know, I look at a lot of American history, I look at a lot of European history. Can you do Crut China versus India? Kraut? That, is, is that what you're talking about? I haven't watched a Kraut video, I don't think. Um, but I've gotten his videos recommended a few times. Kraut has the really long videos on Turkey, right? And then he also has the, uh, like, 
Mexican American War videos, I think. I th I mean, it'd be cool to do Kraut at some point. Or at least I've gotten his videos recommended, but uh, they're so long that uh, that would be a long-ass reaction. But they seem interesting. Uh, the topics seem interesting. Uh, yes, Zod's Aurelian the World Restorer. That's on the list. Um, I can't tell you when I'll get to it. It's on the list, but like my schedule for reactions is planned through um, through June into July. So if I want to add uh, another reaction in, I, I got to start in July. <clears throat> Though one of the reasons why it takes so long to get with to some things is that, like, say, his Stories of Illus is going to release a new video sometime soon, and I'm going to have to fit that in the schedule, so everything else gets pushed back. Um, but yes, Aurelian the World Restore, I would absolutely like to do that um, at some point. Oh, it's a long list. Well, let me tell you, I have reactions planned out into July. My list of potential reactions... Would probably, if I did them, I mean, I probably have, like, years worth of reactions. <laughs> like, I will never run out of reactions, I'll tell you that much. This channel's been going for, a, like, a year and a couple months. We're coming up on a year and a half. Uh, and I've got so many reactions to do. And we're coming up on 2,000 subscribers. That'll be a fun, fun thing to reach. <clears throat> Alfred the Great, and maybe we'll get to him one day, one day, maybe. Yeah, Rome might be restored before I get to, uh, <laughs> get to my last, I mean, the last reaction, it's literally impossible, because, e let's say I, even if I only reacted to kings and generals, they release videos, like, really often, so I will n never run out of reactions. Uh, there's always more to do. And there's so many things we haven't even touched yet. We have done, I don't think, any Latin American history. We haven't done much British history. We haven't done much German history. We haven't done much African history. Um, we haven't done much Greek history. Uh, we haven't done much Chinese. Like, there's so much to do. There's so much to do. We've done a bit of Russian history. We've done some Western European history. We've done some Rome. Uh... And yes, after I finish the Rome reactions, which might take me a while, because I'm still not done with season one, and then we got to do season two, um, but after I'm done with the Rome reactions, I will move on to uh, a new historical series, historical fiction series, or I might do um, like some historical movies. Um, I've gotten some some recommendations. I know one that I want a series that I want to do in particular. This is one that's interests me. I don't know if, how much it interests everybody else, but I really want to do the HBO John Adams series because I know that's been very highly recommended. People really like that one. Um, the Last Kingdom. All right, all right. But there's like, I mean, the thing is, I have so many uh, videos to react to, and then I started with the, uh, like, show and movie reactions, and very quickly I've developed a long list <laughs> of shows and movies to react to that'll take me forever. Or, I think it's HBO. I don't know if it's HBO, but the John Adams miniseries. Uh, I, I know it's very well regarded. I think it's HBO, I don't know. Kings and Generals, Ottomans versus Portuguese, sounds interesting. And in the last kingdom, I've noted that down. Okay, okay, I'll check. What is the last kingdom about? The last kingdom. Oh, I see. All right, all right, all right. I'm seeing it. I'm seeing it. 
Chat, chat, try not to spam. All right, Last Kingdom's on the list. I mean, hey, if you, um, if you check out the Patreon, we have a tier. I think it's called the Professor tier. It's our top tier. Um, but if you subscribe to that tier, you can request one reaction a month. And someone has subscribed to the Professor tier, and they've requested the first episode of I, Claudius, the, the old Roman, uh, the old TV show about, you know, Roman history. And he said that he's going to subscribe to the Professor tier uh, every month, and he's going to request a new episode <laughs> of I, Claudius every month. So, actually, I should say that y'all are getting... Um, the Rome reactions, but now you're going to be getting every month a new I Claudius reaction because, you know, one of your fellow fans is paying for it. So, you know, you can thank him. <clears throat> um, so if anyone's really um, interested in getting a reaction so much that you would pay money for it, um, then you can go check out the Patreon, and if you subscribe at the highest tier, then that's what will happen. Uh, if that, that's absolutely not a requirement. If not, you can just make your recommendations here, and I will eventually get to them. That's the thing. Uh, it's not that, um... Yeah, Praetorian Guard asking for bribes. The, the top tier, the, uh... The professor tier is 15 bucks a month. That's what it is. So it's basically 15 bucks for a reaction. Um, now, look, I. I... So, sh th this is a good point, Shad. What if there's more than one subscriber for that tier? It's capped at five. There's a maximum of five subscribers at that top tier. Because I don't think that I can do more than five requested reactions a month while also doing the other reactions. Um. And if it gets filled up, then I'll just raise the price. Because, you know, supply and demand. Uh, I, I know my economy. What's that in pounds? I don't know. I don't have the... It, it's probably like... Probably like 13 pounds or something. I don't know. <clears throat> I don't have the conversion off the top of my head. But, you don't... Obviously, you don't need to subscribe. Um on the Patreon. Uh, I listen to reactions from the community. Um, it's not that I won't listen to uh, recommendations. It's just that with the paid reaction, what it means is that like I prioritize it. I get to it within a month of you requesting it. All right. Hey, go, yeah, go ahead, Zods. If, uh, yeah, if you really want to do that, you can, you can go and pay and, and you can request that reaction. And then I will get to it within a month of you um, requesting. All right, great. Uh, I see that uh, Skewer Horror Ob or Ob has joined the Discord. Fantastic! That reminds me, everybody, check out the Discord. Um, I think m most of you in here are probably in the Discord, but. It's a great place to be. Uh, we talk about history a lot. We talk about the videos, all that sort of stuff. So please join the Discord. Um, if you're interested in the Patreon, hey, it's linked in the description down below. Um, I know Zod is interested, but any of the rest of you can go join that. Um, tomorrow, we have uh, the uh, you know uh, greatest speech in history, Alexander's speech, um, whatever it's called. Uh, that's what we'll be doing tomorrow. So uh, I know a lot of you have wanted that. So stay excited. Stay excited. Um, I think we're going to be closing down the stream now. Uh, I see now we have arguments about Britain versus the EU. Uh, keep them up if you want to. Uh, yeah, the, the Brexit tangent started to run. I don't want to get involved in the Brexit tangent. Uh, great stream today, everybody. Uh, thank you, everybody, for stopping in. We had some good reactions. We had some good tangents. Uh, we ended with a lot of recommendations. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad to see. Um, so next live stream, I don't have a date for it yet, but I'm hoping relatively soon, you know. Um, 
Yeah, it's it's about 6 p.m. for me. So, you know, it's like it's like evening. I know for the, for the rest of you it's far later. <laughs> I mean, for our Brits, it's 5 hours later and then it's way later for Shad. It's way later for Shad. Um, yeah. We'll do an, a, another live stream soon. Uh, if anybody wants to keep talking, just hop into the Discord. You can continue your conversations there. Thanks, everybody, for stopping by. Uh, good night. See you next time.